As I said before, my name is Carl Dix. I'm going to be a moderator for tonight's program. I'm also a follower of the revolutionary leader, Bob Avakian, and longtime revolutionary. I want to welcome everybody to tonight's program, to this conversation marking the 60th anniversary of the publication of Wretched of the Earth and the instance of the republication of Wretched, because a new edition is coming out with a uh, new introductory essay by one of our speakers tonight, Cornell West. And give it up for the brother. And when I say I'm welcoming everybody, that's the audience here inside Revolution Books. That's the other part of the audience, live audience that is outside Revolution Books right now. And it's everybody on the live stream. That's who we've got here today. Now, Wretched of the Earth was a powerful call to revolt when it was published back in 1961. Today, as conditions in the global South continue to cry out for revolutionary transformation and acute divisions here in the United States heighten revolutionary potential, it is really on time to have this engaging conversation on France Fanon's positive influence as well as shortcomings and the content of national liberation and revolution in today's world. It is also fitting that this conversation happen at Revolution Books because Revolution Books is all about a real revolution that aims for nothing less than the emancipation of all of humanity. It is a bookstore with books, forum critical engagement about the world, and for a new world. It's the intellectual, political, and cultural center for a movement for an actual revolution. At its heart is the work of Bob Avakian, a revolu current revolutionary leader, who is the architect of a new framework for human emancipation, the new communism. Avakian is the author of the Constitution for the New Socialist Republic in North America, a sweeping vision and concrete blueprint for a new socialist society. He's developed a strategy for making revolution right here in the belly of the beast, as we used to say back in the day and as I'm trying to bring back to today, because it's still an imperialist beast. Avakian is the most important political thinker and leader in the world today. And yes, I said that. That's the mission of Revolution Books. And on that basis, we seek to engage and learn from the contributions of many diverse forces. And it's in that spirit that tonight's program, evaluating the legacy of Frantz Fanon, strengths and weaknesses, and then application of that in relation to today. That's why we took this up. I should note that this program is a bookend event of the Brooklyn Books Festival. Uh, there's going to be a second bookend event hosted here at Revolution Books this Saturday at 3 p.m. Its theme is going to be new fiction from the African diaspora with Mukomo Wagugi and Wanjiku Wagugi. They're, those authors are going to be with us for that program. I also want to note that Peter Blackstock from Grove is here tonight. He played an important role in this republication of Fanon's book of Wretched. Now, the format for tonight's program will be as follows. Following my introduction, Dr. Cornell West is going to speak and his presentation will be followed by a presentation from Andy Z. And then we will open it up for participation from the audience, including questions and comments, because we wanna get you all involved in this as well. And I'll have a little more to say about that as we open up. Some housekeeping details. Bathroom is over here. 
if you come by to go to the bathroom, try and, you know, reduce your height a little bit so that you don't end up on the live stream. And, uh, but we know people got to go, so it's going to be, you're, you're, you're welcome to do so. On your phones, you got to silence them. We don't want this conversation interrupted by your phone ringing, you having a conversation with somebody off of it. So silence them. And, and even more than that, just turn them off. You need to be in this conversation. You need to not be distracted from it. Now I have the honor of introducing our speakers for tonight. First to speak, as I said before, will be Dr. Cornell West. He's one of the country's most provocative public intellectuals, and he's been a champion for racial justice since at least his teenage years. He might have done some stuff before that, but I only know of stuff back to his teenage years. In his work, he weaves together the traditions of the Black Baptist Church, progressive politics, and jazz. Dr. West currently teaches at Union Theological Center. And Cornell is no stranger to Revolution Books because this bookstore co-sponsored a dialogue that he did with the revolutionary leader, Bob Avakian, at Riverside Church on the subject of revolution and religion, the fight for emancipation and the role of religion. Following Dr. West, Andy Z will speak. Andy Z is a longtime revolutionary communist leader. He is the host of the weekly YouTube show, Revolution Nothing Less, and the spokesperson for Revolution Books. He's a follower of Bob Avakian and an ardent advocate for his new framework of human emancipation, for human emancipation, the new communism. So with that, I give you uh, Cornell West. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me say it is for me a blessing, honor, and a privilege to come back to Harlem and come back to Revolution Books. It is a homecoming of a grand order. I want to begin by saluting Brother Carl Dick. All right. All right. Oh. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. I have a very, very deep love for Brother Carl. I have a very profound respect for him, not just because I learned so much, and not just because we spend so much time marching and going to jail. And I just went on 124th Street in Frederick Douglass when we were in jail and singing songs. I try to stay in tune. He was in tune all the time. But when I see Brother Jim Fretos and a host of others over there, Randy Credico and others, Nellie Bailey is representing the great Black Agenda Report, Revolutionary Family, all that's not, that's not ever overlooked, Black Agenda Report. Uh, and to be in dialogue with Brother Andy, we've had many, many, many dialogues in restaurants and other places and on the streets and so forth. And anytime we get a chance to zero in on the precious humanity of those friends who known called the wretched of the earth, but we know to be the priceless folk that Sly Stone call everyday people. James Cleveland called ordinary people. In fact, it would just be another week and a half I get a chance to preach at Abyssinian Baptist Church, which is another kind of homecoming for me. There's a wonderful dialectic between revolution books on 132nd Street at Malcolm X, and then just right around the corner, Abyssinian Baptist Church, the legacy of Adam Clayton Powell Sr. and Jr and a whole lot of other black freedom fighters trying to make sense of a deep spiritual decay and more decrepitude in the American empire with its vicious predatory capitalist processes and its white supremacists and male supremacists and deeply homophobic and transphobic dimensions. And part of our challenge 
try to bring together the best of spirit, heart, mind, body, organizing, and mobilizing. And so it's always for me a blessing to have a dialogue with my revolutionary communist brothers and sisters. I have a profound love and respect with so many of my revolutionary communist brothers. I was talking about Brother Jamil and Noche and Sin Carl. We can go on and on and on. Cadre on the ground, righteous indignation, willingness to live, willingness to die for the people. Nothing like that if we're going to change this beast in which we find ourselves and we still swinging, trying to learn how to see more clearly. No theory is kind to us that cheats us of seeing. You can't see AFRICOM on the continent. If you can't see 6,000 military U.S. troops, if you can't see their presence in 43 African countries, if you can't see U.S. imperial presence in Asia and in Latin America, and all you can see is the truncated dialogue between neo-fascist Fox News and neoliberal CNN, that's a key sweat moment. Something, something just ain't right. <laughs> Time for you to see these class struggles going on. Time for you to see the profit-driven profit driven character of a ruling class that is enacting its own internal conflict with neo-fascists becoming stronger and stronger day by day and the neoliberals milk toast but providing some kind of alternative and the people suffering and hungry for an alternative vision to see more clearly and then to feel more deeply what is the scope of your compassion whatever disagreements i have with my revolutionary communist brothers and sisters my love for them is deeper and it's deeper because their love for ordinary people and working people and poor people. I look at the world through the lens of a cross of a Palestinian Jew who died on that cross that said, I am in solidarity with oppressed people. I'm put to death by the Roman Empire. Here we are in the American Empire. What lens do we look at the world through? Do we keep track of our precious folk wrestling with mass incarceration, keep track of decrepit schools, keep track of unavailable childcare, keep track of underemployment, keep track of under, uh, unemployment, keep track of the ways in which the powers that be at the top pit us against each other so we find ourselves reifying our skin pigmentation as if skin pigmentation somehow is a automatic transition to Ethical cultivation, spiritual formation, courageous action, or is it not the case, as Franz Fanon put it so well, everywhere I see the national bourgeoisie in every corner of the world, the dominant tendency is to betray working and poor people. And if we accept that truth, not to demonize them, but to recognize they become so well adjusted to injustice. They become so well adapted to indifference. They become so well accommodated to the empire that the pro major project is to simply make predatory capitalism more diverse, more inclusive, same class structure. Same imperial processes, same ruling class, just make it more black and brown and Asian and women and sexual orientation being open. We do acknowledge how important it is to keep struggles against homophobia and patriarchy. Absolutely. White supremacy, indeed. White supremacy has always been the public face of the American imperial project. Can't even begin to talk about American capitalism without talking about white supremacy. Not first in relation to black people, in relation to indigenous people. Never believed the neoliberal 
gibberish talking about slavery is America's original sin. No, it was the treatment of our precious indigenous brothers and sisters that was the first one because it was an imperial project to take their land, to dispossess their people, and then to impose its settler colonial project and bring then Africans, the precious dignified Africans, my own ascent descendants. That was the second one. And it wasn't just white supremacy doing it all on its own. You got so many of these black intellectuals running around these days in professional managerial spaces in the universities, reifying race, talking about you can talk about white supremacy, independent of predatory capitalist processes, independent of imperial expansionism, independent of these other economic and material processes going on. Yes, we're anti-racist, but if you're just anti-racist, just to gain access to some slot in the imperial project, if you're just anti-racist and all you want is just some middle class status and bourgeois orientation within the capitalist project, then you still got a key sweat moment. Some, some just ain't right. <laughs> just ain't right. And Keith Sweat's a Harlem brother, isn't he? Oh yes, I love me some Keith Sweat. He's not as deep as Joe Levert, but he's trying. <laughs> He was trying, he was trying, they sang together. But I accent the musicians and the artists because oftentimes they are the ones that will allow us to shatter the racial barriers and the gender barriers and enable the kind of solidarity so deeply required in order for the fundamental transformation of this imperial project called the USA with democratic dimensions, absolutely, but so weak. Weak is pre-sweet and Kool-Aid. <laughs> Franz Fanon, and I was blessed to write the introduction. Where's Brother Peter? Just, just, just wave it, yes. Give it up for Brother Peter here. He, he worked so very hard putting this thing together. And where's the book? Do we have a copy of the book? But I think my, my, my beloved wife has a copy of the book, Anna Nina Hita. This is what it looks like. It's a good looking book. <laughs> and it's a good looking book because Franz Fanon loved black people, oppressed people, working people, poor people. He gave everything inside of him. He died at 36 years old in Washington, D.C. The CIA was in the hospital room. The last text he wrote, now 60 years later, we come to discuss where we are now in the spirit of Franz Fanon. I'm a jazz man. I don't believe in imitating anybody, emulating anybody. I got to find my own voice, but I can only find my voice by bouncing my voice against those who came before. He's a great voice. We learn from him, but we critically engage him. And what was he concerned about? He was concerned about the end of the age of European empires. It started in 1492 with Christopher Columbus showing up and thinking he discovered something. Folk already here. It was the banishment of our Jewish brothers and sisters in 1492 from Spain. Spain at that time was a major empire. The inability to come to terms with the humanity of Jewish brothers and sisters in that age of Europe, European empires ended in 1945. The concentration camps of our Jewish brothers and sisters, along with socialists and communists and Roma and gays and lesbians and physically challenged. When millions dead, and nobody wants to focus on the millions dead, especially when they're outside of Europe, or especially when they're poor and working people in Europe. And here we are now, the age of the American empire, the Soviet empire collapsing in 89 and 91. How do we situate ourselves in relation to the spirit of Franz Fanon, looking at the world through the lens of the struggles, the sufferings, and the doings of oppressed people? It's very fascinating. He begins by invoking 
Matthew 20, 16. First shall be last and the last first decolonization is the putting in practice of that sentence. That's what he says at the very beginning of the text. Brother Andy and I have wonderful dialogue and we wrestle with this together. That's an old biblical formulation. Comes from Hebrew scripture. Meaning what? The world's going to be turned upside down. The wealthy and the powerful, obsessed with status, domination, subjugation, shall be radically called into question. And we can argue whether that metaphor is too weak or misleading. But what we cannot deny is that if you look at the world through the lens of Franz Fanon in 2021, it means you're going to put a whole lot of gravitas on the hatred and greed that is institutionalized in the ways in which capitalism reproduces itself that results in what? The possibility that the planet will no longer exist. That's greed on steroids. Obsession with profit on steroids. Nuclear possibility, just pushing a button and it's over. And then economic catastrophe with wealth inequality running amok. And then you add the pandemic. You add the lockdown. You add what's happening in New York right now in terms of workers more and more pushed out. Where are we? Brother Martin said it's chaos or community. Well, what are the revolutionary possibilities in this particular moment in which this kind of ruling class internal conflict, this kind of mass misery, embracing more and more poor and working people and some of the middle classes. Now, the well-to-do, they're off luxurating in the lap of luxury itself. Thoroughly disconnected, unconnected. And yet, sooner or later, as Malcolm used to say, right in this beloved community, chickens will come home to roost. Sooner or later, you're going to reap what you sow. Sooner or later, the very thing that you repress will come return and come to your house and your own community. So what's happening right now on one side of town of gentrification inside your own community? Land grab, power grab, sooner or later, you're going to have to come to terms with the consequences. You're going to have to come to terms with the effects. And what Fanon was saying was, in the 1950s, with the collapse of European empires, I'm going to highlight the decolonizing of Africa and the third world. We want independence in Africa. We want independence in Asia. And we look back now, 50-some years, and what do we see? Neo-colonial elites in these same places, reproducing capitalist processes, reproducing imperial sensibilities, reproducing too often patriarchal sensibilities and homophobic ones, and some of the very ones who were talking about freedom in the 1960s and 70s become the defenders of a status quo that are deeply tied to the U.S. imperial network. Yes, Franz Fanon saw it in the pitfalls of national consciousness. He saw it in the text on national culture, teaching us what? Somehow we've got to generate new forms of solidarity, which means new forms of seeing and feeling and courageous acting and ways in which we organize and mobilize. That's why sometimes it's a, it's a surprise when you see me marching with my revolutionary communist brothers and sisters. There's a beautiful black sister on my left, 75 years old, carrying her Bible. And there's a hip hop artist on the right, having invite in dialogue with Tupac. Uh, MC, Light. And then we got Carl and Andy. And they're talking about my very dear brother, Bob Ovake. And I love that brother too. I have great respect for that brother too. We wrestle with issues. We agree to disagree on certain things, but we look at the world through the lens of oppressed people. Revolutionary Christian, revolutionary communist. Yes, indeed. Why? Because in a desperate situation in which if you don't feel the righteous indignation given the overwhelming suffering and misery in this community and other communities and corners all around the world, then you're not going to be part of the transformation. 
And you may very end up, end up being part of the problem rather than part of the solution, part of the catastrophe rather than part of the resistance to the catastrophe. That's precisely how these multi-layered contradictions are taking place. And we don't know where they're headed, but we do know there's a real chance of fascism in America. And don't think just because we had some milquetoast neoliberal Biden standing in the way to hold it back that that's going to be strong enough. He's too spineless. And we debated on voting for him and so forth and so on. But what old vacant? I mean, vacant came out swinging, didn't he? It's usually, the Revolutionary Communist Party look at me and say, Brother West, you wasting all this time on electoral politics. You know we need revolution. <laughs> You know, we read revolution. I said, oh, I understand my brothers, but I, I've got to be able to also move in and out. I'm an inside outside, putting pressure inside the system, putting pressure outside the system, stealing away on Sunday to worship my God and then breaking loose on Friday night at the nightclub. Now, <laughs> that's what you call jazz life. There's nothing wrong with that. That's what it is to be a black man in America, preserve your sanity at least four days of a week. It's true. <laughs> I'm going to sit down and let my brother talk. But I do want to say this, especially right here in Harlem. That what Fanon understood in talking about revolution is that you have to begin with the psychic scars as well as the economic misery. You got to deal with the spiritual violations of a people as well as the structures and institutions that's coming at them. So in a white supremacist civilization where black love is a crime, anybody who falls in love with black people will be criminalized. Black freedom is cast as a pipe dream. Black hope is a joke. Black joy is a mirage. Black history is a curse. You can hear Garvey saying, the world is made being black a crime. I intend to make it a virtue. All the critiques we can launch of our dear brother Marcus Garvey, he's got a truth there. And all of us in wrestling with our psychic scars and transforming it into making us love warriors and freedom fighters and wounded healers and joy spreaders and sorrow bearers with a revolutionary vision and analysis with a coalition, bringing a whole host of different people together and bringing power and pressure to bear on greedy elites at the top, apathetic folk in the middle, and our precious poor and working folk who themselves oftentimes have been so blinded by the oppression, blinded by the sense of feeling as if they're hitting up against intractable walls, no way out. We say there is a way out. We say we will remain vigilant. We will remain swinging as it were. And yes, Franz Fanon, like Duke Ellington, believed it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. Because when you fight, with a revolutionary vision and analysis, and with various coalitions bringing people together, a solidarity of critiques of capitalism, imperialism, militarism, white supremacy, hatred against anybody, be it Palestinian or Jews, be it Arabs and Muslims, be it Buddhists, be it indigenous peoples. And you say, no, we're gonna transform any form of hatred into a hatred of the structures of oppression and a hatred of the obstacles of folk coming together to try to engage in the expansion of freedom possibilities. Who knows where we end up? It's hard to say. If the neo-fascists triumph, revolution books shut down, Brother Raymond. Andy, myself, Anna Heath and my wife, Carl, Sister Levette and all of her loveliness, they're going to try to crush us like cockroaches. And we say, we are committed no matter what. 
because we got a love and a commitment to the people. And that's very important. Because if all they can do is kill us, then that shows their limitations. Because we got ideas, we got legacies, we got memories that will live on forever. And so, so it is with Franz Fanon 60 years later, so it is with us 60 to 2021 trying to look for ways out. That's what Brother Andy and I and Carl are here to do, trying to find some ways out. Brother Andy, Brother Andy, come on. Yeah, absolutely. I think Anna Heath got that. Thanks, Obey. All right. We had a lot of books that were falling uh, down there, so I'm going <laughs> to remove them. I'm, people know me as, as the uh, spokesperson of Revolution Books. But I've been away in Los Angeles organizing for the revolution, and I am very glad to be back here, especially with Brother Cornell West and Carl Dix and all of you. Um, but first, before I start, let's uh, give it up for that fire from Cornell West. We are prepared to make any sacrifice that's necessary to overthrow this beast of U.S. imperialism. But what I'm going to be talking about today is there is a way to win. And that's what we got to do, because not just because we want to be winners, but because the masses of humanity are counting on us. So I want to thank you, Cornell. Mm -hmm. What we're doing this evening is both welcoming a new generation to this classic work of Franz Fanon that 60 years ago passionately called for the people of Africa to rise up and to cast out and to cast off colonization by the European powers. And we would be remiss if at the same time we failed to learn from the positive aspects of Fanon, as well as to look critically at what Fanon wrote, both in its time, but especially now that the world is in such dire need to throw off the scourge of imperialism. The hour is late. The hour is very late for the future of humanity. So a critical look with an eye to what is to be done now will be my main focus in this presentation. I look forward to a lively and engaged uh, principled dialogue that will have unity and struggle within it. That's what we need if we're going to get to understand the reality we face, what the problem is and what the solution is. I too want to thank Grove Press for publishing this book and for being here tonight and making this night possible. I want to thank the Brooklyn Book Festival, who once again, uh, having Revolution Books as a site of their bookends offsite uh, uh, festival each year. And I want to thank all of you here in Revolution Books. And while I can't see you, I want to thank everybody out in the street we have, and I'm not just talking about passers-by, I'm talking about that we've got people sitting, sitting out in front of the store watching this program, and I want to thank everybody on the live stream. Well, well done. Well done. So, reading a new Franz Fanon over the last few weeks, The Wretched of the Earth, I was struck, too, by the fire of his implacable hatred for European colonialism what it had done to the very being of the people in the colonies of Africa. Fanon's vividly portrayed psychic cost in the bodies, the minds, and the spirits are like daggers. Fanon was on a mission to sound an alarm and wake up nations and peoples. And what stands out most in the wretched of the earth is Fanon's understanding of how the degradation, the white supremacy, the terror inflicted by colonialism impacted the mentality of the oppressed. He writes, quote, in the colonial countries, the policeman and the soldier, by their immediate presence and their frequent direct action, maintain contact with the native and advise him by means of rifle butts and napalm. 
not to budge. It is obvious here that the agents of government speak the language of pure force, end quote. And as Cornell said, Fanon also excoriates the ruling class, the local national bourgeoisie, subordinated to and subservient to the colonizing imperialists. He trenchantly exposes and reveals how they will not and must not be relied on to lead the struggle for liberation. Fanon was an advocate and an active participant in the revolutionary struggle in Algeria to throw off French rule. For these reasons and more, Fanon had a positive impact on tens of thousands of militant youth who awoke to political life in the 1960s, drawing them towards revolution. He's an important part of that era, and as such, he should be studied today with both the positive contributions and his shortcomings learn from in order for us to go forward. At the same time, in retrospect, and from the point of view of what has been learned over the decades since, and specifically through the work of Bob Avakian, that he's done to develop the new communism, it is possible and it is necessary to conclude that there are some significant shortcomings in Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth that can lead to real problems. I want to first draw attention to two matters of fundamental principle. One, Fanon argues that, quote, and Cornell read this, the colonized man liberates himself in and through violence. The praxis enlightens the militant because it shows him the means and the ends. Now look, praxis means practice. For Fanon, it is through violence that the colonial mentality is shed. And it is through violence which determines what the goal is. Now, it's not nothing to the idea that actually waging struggle, including armed struggle against the oppressor, can, if it is part of an overall correct approach, contribute to casting off the superstitious awe that people have towards the oppressive force that has ruled over and degraded them. But violence against the oppressors, against the, violence against the oppressors is not or should not be the purpose or the end in and of itself in waging revolutionary struggle. The purpose, the goal, needs to be something much higher and much more profound. Putting an end to the oppressive system, putting an end to all oppression and exploitation, emancipating all the oppressed and ultimately all of humanity. And violence, which historical experience and the application of a scientific method demonstrate is necessary to achieve this fundamental goal and purpose, must be waged in a way consistent with and as an expression of the goal and purpose, this goal and purpose, and not something in contradiction and conflict with it, or something else is going to happen. Number two, along with this, Fanon says, which Cornell cites in his introduction as the very definition of decolonization. Quote, the last shall be first. Decolonization is verification of this. No, no. The goal of lib for liberation should not be the last shall be first, but rather getting to the point where throughout the world, there are no longer those who are first and those who are last. The goal needs to be getting to a communist world with the achievement of overcoming all classes and class distinctions, all the enslaving relations of exploitation from the capitalist imperialist mode of production, all of the social relations that correspond to those relations of production, and all of the ideas which reflect and reinforce those exploitive and oppressive relations throughout the whole world. First developed by Marx, these four alls are a hallmark and a fundamental principle of the new con communism. But without this, without this, we're all back to all the inequality and horrors of the system that billions of people suffer under today. If we are aiming for eliminating all forms of exploitation and oppression worldwide, we need to critically look at how Fanon approaches the relationship between nationalism 
and internationalism. Mm -hmm. Fanon essentially sees that nationalism is a precondition for internationalism. With internationalism reduced to an expression of support for another nation's struggle for independence. Now, in this connection, there's a breakthrough in the new communism developed by Baba Vakian, is the understanding that in an overall and fundamental sense, the international dimension is principal and decisive. Why? Because imperialism is an international system. What happens in the economic, political, and ideological life of any single country is more determined by the dynamics of what is going on in the world as a whole than by the internal dynamics within any one country. And waging the revolutionary struggle in a particular country has its own particular features and dynamics, but these are secondary to the material, material reality that these revolutions take place as part of a larger process on a world level. This is one more reason why our goal must be to emancipate all of humanity all over the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So continuing our charge tonight to discuss the relevance of the wretched of the earth to revolution and liberation, I want to turn to the new introduction by Cornel West, which I'm sure most of you have not yet read since you just got the book tonight. <laughs> now, I am going to be accurate here. <laughs> Maybe he'll dispute it, but I'll be accurate. Look, the new introduction puts forth some very pertinent points, including Fanon's influence on the revolutionary anti-colonial struggle in the 1950s and the 1960s, where Cornell writes that Fanon tells of, quote, an empire-driven analysis of a warlike white supremacy that permeates the very souls of colonial subjects as well as shapes every sphere of colonial society, end quote. Yet at the same time, I think that there are statements that are wrong and harmful, both in their historical context for what is, and for what is urgently needed today and what is possible today. To begin, there are the first two sentences of the new introduction, quote, Franz Fanon is the greatest revolutionary intellectual of the mid 20th century. He is also the most relevant for the 21st century. Now with that first sentence, we must respectfully but strongly disagree. The greatest revolutionary intellectual of the mid 20th century and up until his death in 1960, 1976, was Mao Zedong. Yes, Mao was a revolutionary intellectual and a theoretical as well as a practical revolutionary leader. It was Mao who in the, mid of, in the middle of the 20th century, in 1949, led the long process of the Chinese revolution to victory, emancipating hundreds of millions of Chinese people from centuries of horrific inhuman oppression and exploitation by imperialists and domestic exploiters and oppressors, and then led them in the continuation of this revolution while providing inspiration to billions of oppressed people all throughout the world, including black people right here in the US whose struggle against oppression Mao strongly supported. In the course of doing this, Mao developed a theoretical, political, and strategic, as well as ideological lines that scientifically expose the features of colonial oppression, not only in China, but in the colonized, the neo-colonized countries generally. And he provided important orientation and guidance for the revolutionary struggle in those countries with significant relevance for the revolutionary struggle in the world as a whole, including in imperialist countries like this one, the United States. Mao also spoke of the problem of the colonial mentality that Cornell was talking mm -hmm. about and that Fanon talks about. For example, there is this typically earthy comment that, quote, as soon as a foreigner farts here, there is always someone Chinese to say it smells good. <laughs> Following the initial victory of the Chinese revolution and with the advance on the road of socialist construction and transformation for several decades, Mao continued advancing the scientific theory of revolution. 
including his most crucial contribution, the basis for the danger of the restoration of capitalism after the revolution. A painful but scientific understanding, which was unfortunately borne out after Mao's death. Look, there's more to say about Mao's contributions, and I've prepared a short paper from which I drew this talk, uh, which you can get at the counter or from a representative of Revolution Books tonight that goes more into Mao and also goes more into Bob Avakian. Which will bring me to the second sentence of Cornell's introduction, that Fanon is also the most relevant revolutionary intellectual for the 21st century. Here again, we must respectfully but strongly disagree. An article on our website, revcom.us, states simply and clearly on a scientific basis, Bob Avakian B.A. is the most important political thinker and leader in the world today. Bob Avakian is a revolutionary intellectual on the highest level who has brought forward a further synthesis of communism, a new synthesis popularly known as the new communism. And in developing the new communism, B.A., that's what we call him, not everybody can pronounce Bob Avakian or remember it, but B.A., has, with a critical scientific approach drawn from the mainly positive experience, but also from the secondary, and in some cases, serious errors of the communist movement, and the experience of the revolutionary struggle broadly, including an early reading of Fanon, and from a broad range of human endeavor. The result of this is that communism has been put on an even firmer scientific foundation with an even more consistently scientific approach and method, and with an even more thoroughly internationalist orientation, including by critiquing and moving beyond certain secondary but significant tendencies in Mao that went against his overall internationalist orientation. Now, one of the most important expressions of the new communism is the determined struggle that BA has waged to root out of the communist movement the poisonous notion that the ends justify the means, mm -hmm. that any means are justified if the goal is or proclaimed to be righteous. Let me say that again. He's rooted out of the communist movement, the poisonous notion that the ends justify the means, that any means are justified if the goal is or proclaimed to be righteous. In opposition to this, BA has insisted that the means utilized in the revolutionary struggle must be in keeping with and an expression of its emancipatory goal. BA repeatedly emphasizes that the purpose of this revolution is not revenge, and the fundamental goal is not the last shall be first and the first last, but is the emancipation of humanity and the bringing into being of a world in which there will no longer be those who are first and the many others who will be last. More, he's developed an actual strategy for making and winning a revolution in a country like this. He's authored, as Carl Dick said earlier, the Constitution for a New Socialist Republic in North America, which is a sweeping vision and a concrete blueprint for a radically new and emancipatory society. These are unprecedented contributions to revolution. And last, it is worth returning to the following statement from the conclusion of Cornell's introduction. Franz Fanon is one of the few great revolutionary intellectuals who always connected the psychic and the political, the existential and the economic, the spiritual and the social, end quote. Here again, as a revolutionary intellectual, theoretician, and practical revolutionary leader, Far more than anyone else today, and even beyond what is true of the previous great leaders of the communist rev revolution, the communist movement, Baba Bakian has connected the economic, the political, the social, as well as the cultural, and yes, the existential, in the right sense, the spiritual and the psychic, in a comprehensive synthesis that is grounded strongly in a thoroughly materialist and dialectical scientific method and approach. So we can get into some of this in the conversation. Absolutely. So again, we must respectfully but strongly insist that, particularly in terms of the urgent needs in this time, while there are things to learn from the best of what is represented and has, and has been contributed by Fanon, as well as from what is negative, 
Beyond that, the most advanced scientifically based synthesis of revolutionary thinking overall, the most important body of work of an intellectual, theoretical, and practical revolutionary is what has been developed and even now is being further developed by Bob Avakian. There is a short piece, as I said before, that we've prepared uh, that on which I base this talk. Uh, that uh, goes into these critiques in, in more depth, and that's available at the counter on your way out or from staff members. But here's the situation. Far too, people, far too few people have even heard of Bob Avakian, and still fewer have seriously engaged the crucial work that he has done and is continuing to do. Just a little aside here, we were just talking beforehand, and I think in the last year, Bob Avakian has written 80 articles that are really incredible that they're on the website, revcom.us. They're very deep, they're very provocative, they're outrageous, and they're scientific. This is a serious problem that too few people have even heard of Bob Avakian. That all of us have an important responsibility to change so that the profound and even sick existential situation that is confronting the masses of people in the world and humanity as a whole can be transformed in a positive way. And this is essential if we want to get out from under the horrors of this system and really get free. So with that, I think that's a provocation and, a, and, and some meat for a discussion good, that we're going to have. Absolutely. <laughs> I think we're going to move. Oh, I got to run. You sure? Yeah, yes, sir. Your back is that strong? It's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I'm going to need the mic. You can make this. Okay. Cornell, are you thirsty? Uh, I got a little age too. There's like here, 10 bottles of water here. Is that right? Anybody else need some water out here? Do, uh, <laughs> Can you give me my oh, we got to get our. Oh, never mind. I'll start another bottle. Here. No, no, we'll take we, a new one. we got our dear sister here. This, 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 this beautiful hat she got. <laughs> yeah. Are you all right, though, man? Uh, thank you so much, though, man. An example of serving the people. <laughs> but can, 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 can I jump you, right you, in? What a response, You didn't tell brother? people that we're having a conversation first, I don't think. Yeah. I thought I did. Did he? Yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, just, do we have a little back and forth? Yeah, we're going to have a back and forth. Oh, okay. I think you just said we're opening it. We're not opening it up right away to Q and A. That's yeah. We're going to move into the back and forth mm -hmm. between our two speakers. I wanted to thank them both first for their <laughs> presentation. And I'm sure that you all have some things that you want to talk about to each other. I did think that an important theme, which both of you all touched on, had to do with the last shall be first and the first shall be last, connected with ends and means and the need for them to be consistent. And I think that's a good place for us to start in our conversation. Absolutely. You can begin, Cornell. Before you begin, can people see Cornell? No, I'm just wondering how oh. we're going to do. Maybe what we do. Oh, well, we can just move just back. You a can bit. Uh, look over our. Yeah, I, I, I can get a little closer. You're not the first one that's looked over my shoulder. But. Well, there you go. You all right? <laughs> okay. There we go. No, absolutely. No, indeed, indeed. Let's let's wrestle with this in a comradely way because you raised so many crucial questions. I mean, one is that. Uh, you know, I come from a tradition of lift every voice. There's a variety of different towering figures. It's not going to be either or. I want to be the first to say that my brother, Bob Avakian, has vision, has analysis, must be an indispensable voice in any conversation talking about revolution in the 21st century. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And I want to go down on record, read his work, wrestle with his text. There's no doubt that when people put pen to paper, 50, 100 years from now, if the planet is around, they're going to go back to the writings of Brother Bob Ovechkin alongside others. Fanon is going to be there. C.L.R. James is going to be there. W.B. Du Bois is going to be there. Sylvia Winters is going to be there. There's going to be a variety of voices. But the question is, 
the lens through which they look at the world and the context in which they find themselves, what will be their primary focus? This is a crucial. What my defense of my claim, and you, you all tell me what you think about this, about Franz Fanon is see, Fanon understood that the latter part of the 20th century and early part of the 21st century was going to be a matter of coming to terms with the American empire. And you can't come to terms with the American empire without a very, very intense analysis of white supremacy and imperialism and predatory capitalism. Mao is a towering figure in a Chinese context. You don't go to Mao for an analysis of white supremacy. That's not his context. He has tremendous influence, impact all around the world, right? But in, in order to come to terms with the future of the planet, you've got to zero in on the U.S. Con empire. Why? Because it is the mightiest empire in the history of the world. Now, the Chinese empire is expanding. It's got, got its predatory capitalist activities going on under, yeah. under authoritarian communist party. That's another kind of analysis and the ways in which China has, has violated the legacy of Mao and a whole host of different ways. We won't get into all that now. But, but, but the point is this, and you tell me whether you agree, that you can't, you can't downplay the gravitas of the psychic, spiritual, and cultural dimension of white supremacy, and, and, and yet you must have a material analysis of class struggle and of capitalism and imperialism. That's what Fanon provided as uh, 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 a discourse for, not because he was right. He was wrong on violence. You're absolutely right. Means and ends, wrong. I mean, Ovakian's breakthrough there is fundamental. John Dewey and Trotsky had argued the same thing way back in the 30s, means and ends in this regard. Absolutely. And one last point, I can go on and on about the biblical reference, though. Because yeah, 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 yeah. I know anytime I throw Hebrew scripture out to my secular brothers and sisters, you know, they start getting uh, uneasy. Oh, 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 wait, wait, what's going on here? And you're absolutely right. I do agree. The end is not to just flip the first to the last and the last to the first. See, what that Palestinian Jew named Jesus meant when he said that was very much what Martin Luther King Jr. meant when he said, we're fighting for the beloved community. The beloved community is a space and place in which deep love and genuine egalitarian relations and justice reign. And when you talk about the new communism as undercutting any in the last and first and first and last, I agree with that because we're talking about one in which justice, equality, democracy, flower, floor, so that the humanity of each and every one of us can be affirmed such that there is no fundamental basic needs that are left unsatisfied. And, and in that sense, the words of 20, Matthew 20, 16 signify a beloved community in which all of us have equal status owing to our dignity as human beings. And what I love about Brother Ovakian's work, and in, in, in some ways it's very similar to my own uh, dissertation that I wrote at Princeton over 45 years ago. My dissertation was called The Ethical Dimensions of Marxist Thought. People would argue Marx has no ethics. People would argue Marx doesn't have, Marx, Marx does not to take time to engage in moral reflection. Ovakian and myself disagree. And he has worked very hard consistently generating a moral dimension and a spiritual sensitivity, even as he holds on to his deep secular orientation as a militant atheist. And I love the brother for being atheist. Most good Christians ought to be atheistic about most things. <laughs> and most gods, ain't no doubt about that. But we have fundamental disagreements in terms of my own Christian faith and the relation between a Jesus and a God, and we won't get into all of that. But the important point here is, it's not as far-fetched in terms of that last and first and first and last, signifying this beloved community. But what, 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 what would you believe? I think I, I think I can deal with- Oh, you can deal with you. We, we both got these mics. Oh, we, we both this, have this it. Is, this, is for, this is for the audience. We Let don't me need... just say this quickly. Okay. We ask that people not take video and photos during this, presentation. Everything's going to be posted up on the website, Rev, Rev Books, 
revolutionbooksnyc.org. You'll be able to get it all, and we'd just like you to not be doing that right now. Go ahead, Andy. All right, well, look, I think just leaving aside the uh, theological explanation for um, for the last shall be first and the first shall be last, we have to recognize this is, and I think you did there, but this mm -hmm. is a huge problem. I mean, before I became a communist, I was a fan of Bob Dylan, and he has it in his song, right? Times are changing, right? Right. right, this, right. So th this is this has been influenced the social movement. This has influenced revolutionary movements. It's thick in Fanon. It's thick, and how this gets understood is exactly what it says. That you had your go, now it's my turn. And this is infected. It's poisoned even the social movements of today. Let's be honest about this. What go, some, a lot of what goes on even in the cancel culture is you had your turn, now it's mine. That's mine. People owning their own oppression. I don't want to go start too much on the current a political climate, we'll probably get into mm, that more yeah, later on, but sure, this, the sure. last shall be first and the first shall be last is, is, is a tremendous impulse that people have. And of course, people are angry and need to be even angrier at their oppressors. Of course they do. And their oppressors do need to be driven out, but for the purpose of ending oppression. And just by the way, Mao was applicable on the question of national oppression and and it was not, in terms of the particular conditions in China, it was Han supremacy. Mm. They did, did tremendous work trying to overcome mm. the oppression of national minorities in China. White supremacy is at the foundation of U.S. society. It yeah. is, it is yeah. so interwoven into it that, as Baba Bacon has said, white supremacy and capitalism, you can't get rid of one without getting rid of the other. They're completely intertwined, and that's true for a lot of Europe mm -hmm. as well. But you have, there is plenty for the countries in Africa to learn from Mao about the relationship between the dominant nationality, including within Africa. You know, I came up at a time when the, during the, the, well, I don't want to back into the history of the Biafran War, but there was, it, within the African countries, and actually Fanon touches on this, there's all kinds of oppression that was going on and, and, and color codes and uh, in North Africa, particularly against the Arabs, and then in some places in North Africa, the Arabs, Arabs against the black Africans. This is a problem. We actually have to, that, that there has to be a confrontation with it. It has to, it, 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 it not only retards, slows down the movement for, for a revolution, but it ideologically lays the groundwork for the restoration of capitalism. In fact, we're never even moving beyond it because if you're exactly some of the things you talked about in your opening talk, that if your aspiration is to, and this was, this was thick in, in Phnom, as in some cases as a, as a criticism of the national bourgeoisie. See, here's some of the complexity of Phnom. He criticizes the nat national bourgeoisie for just wanting to get, take the place of, mm -hmm. take the place of the, the colonialists, and at some points he criticizes them for just wanting to be the managers of the colonial enterprises and reap those profits for themselves. But even the, see, here's in every revolution, the, the, uh, the people who are the advocates of a revolution, the voices of the revolution, are people, intellectuals from the petty bourgeoisie, or people from the masses who become intellectuals and then themselves are in that middle strata who represent the ideas of this. And to the degree they propagate this idea this idea that they've had a go, now we have to have a go, they are not understanding the world objectively, how it actually exists and what it's gonna take to rid the world of colonialism and capitalism. You see, this is where it becomes very, this is why, I mean, how many times you'll hear in this bookstore the word science and scientific, and you know, Bob Avakian has said, in fact, in the dialogue with you, oh, <laughs> science, it's a scary word. Well, there's been plenty of bad science and science that's been, been um, utilized by uh, imperialists and capitalists and ruling classes to no end. But science itself has been a tremendously liberating factor. It's actually saving lives. And God damn it, a lot of people, including the woke people in this society, you ought to listen to some of the science and get the goddamn vaccine. And, and you, don't, you, know, you don't have a right to kill people. Oh, it's infringing on my rights. You don't have a right to walk around and spread disease. There's enough science behind this. I'm going off track here. But, but I think that 
science in turn applied to the understanding of what is the problem that we face. What is the problem that plagued Africa? What is the problem that plagued the colonies in the Caribbean, in Central America? The problem is capitalism imperialism. Yes, you have to drive imperialism out. But then what are you putting in its place? A new capitalist society? You'll be right. And this is what happened. This is what happened. It's a fucking tragedy what happened. Not for want of bravery, heroism, not for want of sacrifice, determination, military skill. But these revolutions, these anti-colonial struggles were turned around in chapter four on the importance of a scientific leadership in Baba Vakian's book, The New Communism, which is a real primer, an advanced course, if you will, in it. But it begins in chapter four on the necessity for leadership, talking about the importance of a scientific leadership. We have had too many revolutions, including too many communist revolutions that weren't thoroughly and consistently scientific, but had some of what's even in Fanon this reification of, oh, the oppressed, by virtue of being oppressed, understand their problem and know the solution. No, they don't. They know what it feels like. They know how it comes at them and how it comes at other people. But you can't understand how capitalism actually works, what's at the root of it, what is the mode in which things are produced in society just by virtue of the oppression that you personally face. And if you don't know the problem you face, you're not going to get to the solution. You don't even have a clue on it. It'd be like if you had, uh, if you had AIDS and you start having sarcomas on your, on your skin and you say, oh, look at this. And somebody says, well, here's some cream you can put over this. It'll cover it up but you don't get to the underlying virus that's killing you. We're the same with cancer. You've got to get to the root of the problem. You have to know what you face. And this approach of, of just by virtue of the oppressed being oppressed and, the, and, and playing on their desire to not be oppressed, which is what the first shall be last and the last shall be first conjures up for people. It also goes along it, with it, revenge. It, it, it goes it can, along with it revenge. It be appropriate in the way that you're saying, but you would agree that Fanon has a profound revolutionary humanism. Reminds me really of Lorraine Hansberry and Paul Robeson at Du Bois, that in his text, he's calling for, very much like Ovakian, a new humanity in which the leaders will emerge who are accountable to everyday people, the masses. So his critique of the sheer corruption of the national bourgeoisie, which would also be a critique of the corruption of middle-class leadership that becomes obsessed with things and positions and power and spectacle and loses sight of the plight and misery of everyday people. That's not just scientific failing, that's a corruption. That's a moral and spiritual corruption too especially when you have no accountability. So that I think Fanon would come back at you and say, you know, once we have debates about last and first and first and last, mm -hmm. that new humanism that he pulls from, he, he's calling for. And what does he say? He says, he embraces the best of all of these civilizations. Europe has its contribution to make, including Karl Marx. But it's the crimes of Europe. And Europe is not reducible just to its crimes. Just like blackness is not reducible just to its good stuff. We got black thugs too. A woman not reducible to just the good stuff. It's the humanity that he's after. That's the similarity between Avakian and Fanon that I see. It's just that you're right to highlight the way in which that particular biblical reference can generate a revenge. I get yours, you get mine, survival of the slickest, thou shall not get caught, 11th commandment. <laughs> That's American culture in its dominant form. Just get over by any means. But in addition to that, though, coming back to Mao just quickly, that we, of course, we learn from Mao. And I got a little reference to Mao in relation to Clausewitz in the text in terms of uh, guerrilla warfare uh, uh, and, and violence under certain circumstances. But the way the 20th century and the 21st century developed 
with the centrality of the United States empire. That all the analysis of Han supremacy in the Chinese context see, doesn't have the same impact and insight as an analysis of white supremacy in the U.S. empire and its relation to Africa. This is why the Pan-African voices are so important. This is why Garvey still lives. Because they have insight into how you come to terms with a black folk who have been taught to hate themselves and generate love warriors against that hatred. You need to have an analysis of the dynamics of white supremacy to do that. And Mao's analysis of hand supremacy is not the same thing. In that context, it's marvelous. It's not in this context. You see. Now, Ovakian well, has more to say about the analysis of white supremacy than Mao does, well, because he comes out of Berkeley, California, Black Panther Party, con fundamentally committed to struggles against white supremacy. Yeah, does, does okay. that make sense? Does that make sense? It's certainly true about Bob Avakian and the liberation of black people. That's been at the heart. Perhaps that's just, that is that's, at the heart that's, of, that's, but, that's but the heart of Mao, the heart of what Mao's work was, was not just on the question of the, of, of the national question within China. The heart of oh, his no, work no, no, was no, no, the heart of his work. So this is actually gets important because you mentioned a number of different right, people, right? Um, and, and and even the humanism uh, uh, towards the latter part of the wretched of the earth. Mm -hmm. The problem is human, a feeling for all of humanity and the strengths of different cultures unmoored from the material basis for actually transforming society to overcome all the inequality, all the social relations that correspond to the capitalist system. You know, when I said that, that Mao talks about, uh, or that, that actually Mao and the Chinese in the Cultural Revolution resurrected what we called then I spoke of the four alls, the overcoming of the class distinctions generally in society, overcoming all the relations of production people have to go into to, to correspond to that, all the social relations. And those social relations include patriarchy, they include white supremacy, they include the division between mental and manual labor, where some people work only with their bodies, where other, a few people get the privilege of working with their minds, and well as the um, all the ideas that are based on this. And Mao also took about the rural uh, 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 urban contradiction too. But the thing that I want to get to with Mao is that he said, look, there is a national liberation struggle. China was tremendously oppressed by colonialism. You know, we've often, they, they talked about it and we've often brought out how there were signs in Shanghai, the most advanced city within China before the revolution in the city parks that said no dogs are Chinese allowed in their own country. And he had to get free from imperialism, but Mao developed a different way to go at this than what he called the new democracy, which he recognized the need for the national struggle, but he said we have to go right as quickly as we can. Well, we have to incorporate these other social classes. This is not just for the proletariat here. These other classes, we have to move to socialism very quickly because if we don't change the economic system, then all this oppression will come back in a heartbeat. And that is what Fanon doesn't understand because he rejected Marxism. No, it, well, well, he, no, no, no. He said, I'm stretching. He said, I'm stretching. Marx. He says he's stretching Marxism, but he's he doesn't. Have, okay, okay, but he doesn't. In this book, uh, for people who read the book, there's right. no discussion of why this mode of production and, you know, we can get into what right, is that right, mode of production. Right, it right. means how everything is produced in a society. Every society has to produce the means of life for people, right? And to be able to reproduce a new, uh, a mm -hmm. new society. And, and uh, you know, for most of humanity's existence, we were hunter-gatherers. is not a very pretty life, but it also wasn't class divided. And then, we, you know, we went through different epics, which I'm not going to take the time to go into from, right. from slavery, through feudalism. And then capitalism is a particular mode of production. It's, it's a way things get produced. And it stands in the way, frankly, of any of the kinds of changes that uh, anybody who has a care for humanity would want to, to, to live in. It stands as an obstacle because why? Because things are produced socially in society. Anything in this, everything in this room is produced by thousands of people except for some of the beautiful knit things that some people here might have made themselves. But most of us, when we go buy clothes, there's thousands of people behind this. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. growing cotton in India, 
putting it together in Bangladesh, shipping it to the United States, where the trees were mined, were, were, were timbered in, in Brazil, put into packaging that's developed to make me feel like I have to go to uh, the Gap to buy this shirt that's advertising. This uh, production's highly socialized, but it's controlled and privately appropriated by capitalists who what, are doing what? They are competing with each other to more, who can more efficiently not only get to market, but fundamentally exploit people even, even more. But for Howard no, no, no would agree with your critique of that. Okay, but then he does, oh, there, there has yeah. to be a, a scientific understanding yeah. that that has to actually be overthrown and replaced oh. by a different social system. If you don't do that, you're right back there and the Absolutely. last shall be first and revenge. Absolutely. And all this leads you to, to replicate it. Because what I was going to say before, right. Right. I know maybe I'm going on a little no, bit no, about no, this, no, but these are, deep, these are deep things Absolutely. which people should go into the work of Bob Vicky, and he's there's some... Uh, in addition to the new communism, there's some shorter articles that actually explain this one on commodity production itself. But in that chapter I cited, he references a book we sell here called The Looting Machine that walks through the neo-colonialism, the, the, the colonial revolutions in Africa and the neo-colonialism that resulted from this. And, you know, it's and I said these were not people who lack courage. And he talks about Isabel dos Santos, who's the first woman billionaire in Africa, quite an achievement. What's so fucking painful is that she's the daughter of a leader, I believe it was the MPLA. Yes. yes, in Angola. In Angola, the liberation forces. This is what it's come to. Carl mentioned earlier that the son and one of the sons and one of the daughters of Gugi Watianga, who is a great friend of Revolution Books, who opened this store uh, mm. when, when, we, when we moved here mm -hmm. to Harlem. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it, we've had some very painful discussions on this very stage. His brother was in uh, the Peace and Land Party, I think it was called, popularly known as the Mau Mau. He's a child of that revolution. And Kenyatta's grandson now ruling over a country that's a nightmare. A nightmare. We have to face up to the fact that unless you get to the source of the problem, which is this capitalist imperialist system, and replace it with a radically different system, then all the good thoughts, all the wonderful things that we want, the end of patriarchy, the end of, of national oppression in this country, white supremacy at the heart of the whole country. Mm -hmm. It's the heart of it. So it's what's driving this fascist regime. And the Democrats have no answer. It's another discussion which we've had oh, together and no, refuse fascism. Absolutely. But this is this is a this is important and stuff. But you have to get to, to even get to work on this. You've got to overthrow this system. You have to overthrow it. And if you don't overthrow it, it will if you simply reestablish it with new people up on top, it will do the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. no, and no, we've we, seen we, that over we, and over again. We, 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 and yeah. by the way, Mao's greatest contribution, which I mentioned, was recognizing how capitalism would, could be and restored under a socialist state, which is what happened first in the Soviet Union in the 1950s, and then after Mao mm -hmm. died in China. Okay. So that now today, whatever they call their party, the Communist Party of China, it is a thoroughly capitalist and now even imperialist country and not wanting to penetrate Africa as a new imperialist force. This is Absolutely. what they're doing. And it's a, once again, but this is why again, this... though, you see how white supremacy comes back. The, 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 the struggle over the resources on the continent of Africa, that AFRICOM I made reference to, both empires, Chinese empire and American empire, salivating for mm -hmm. the resources of our precious African mm -hmm. brothers and sisters. It's like the Berlin Conference of 1884, yeah. when the 13 European countries came together salivating for the resources. This we agree on <laughs> completely. Oh, no, yeah. oh, yeah, absolutely. No, indeed, indeed, indeed. But again, it's just a matter of, of acknowledging the ways in which the distinctive feature of the United States empire, right, in which white supremacy, we agree, is so central. Again, Oh, Vacant is just strong on this and Mao. You just got to acknowledge that. Mao's a Chinese brother. He got his own context. He ain't worried about Jamal and Letitia. He ain't worried about my grandma. No, but that's not true. He, he, he's not. Not in his analysis. But in he, 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 his concern, his sensitivity. He is an international revolutionary. He's concerned about their plight. He can't get inside of their worlds. He's a Chinese brother in his own context. That's like asking Du Bois to give Du Bois' analysis on Han's superiority in China. Du Bois say, 
I got other priorities at the moment. <laughs> I'm trying to make sure black folk are free. I'm in solidarity. He did the same thing in Bedker with the Dalit people, right? With the Dalit folk. He writes on Bedker and says, I'm in solidarity. I don't have an analysis of Brahmin superiority of how you all are being degraded. I don't, that takes a whole lot of effort. If you want to be were, scientific about it, a lot of discipline. I'm doing this with black people here, but I have a solidarity with you. That's all we can ask of any of us in that sense. But it just means that all of us would have our limitations in terms of our analyses without necessarily precluding the possibility of our working together. Because the Black Panther Party was deeply influenced by Mao, profoundly influenced by Mao. But Fanon spoke to their lived experience. At least that's what I saw in the 1960s when I was with working with the Black Panther Party with Shiloh Baptist Church. I never joined, but I was working with him. Oh, yes. Fanon was speaking at a very, but not just Fanon in this book, it's Black Skin and White Mass. It's his whole analysis, his whole corpus that he's wrestling with. And in that sense, that's what, why I'm talking about. We need all of these voices. This is not either or. We don't want anybody leaving here thinking that one should not read Avakian or not read Mao or not read Du Bois or not read Franz Fanon, but then have your own critical reflections about what you see when you read all of them. And in that sense, I think it's very important to accent the presence of all of them. Okay, all right, I wanted to do two things. First, your brothers have anticipated and spoken to all of my thematics well, that good. I had that's for the back good. and forth. That's good. That's good. So we're gonna to move to the next part of things, which is the interaction with the audience. I do wanna add though, just on this question of Mao and the struggle of black people, one of the things that moved me to become a revolutionary is a short statement that Mao made. The evil system of colonialism and imperialism rose to prominence on the basis of savage exploitation. I'm paraphrasing now because I don't remember everything exact anymore. And it will surely come to its end with the complete emancipation of the black people. And that made me think I got to include this brother yeah, yeah, in yeah. my reading list yeah, for solitary yeah. confinement in Leavenworth. And that was an important part <laughs> That's real. of my path to becoming a revolutionary communist. Okay. But before you do, Carl, that people should know, younger people don't know, that statement was issued after Martin Luther King yes. was, right. was assassinated. Okay. No, no. Huh? Wasn't no. issued? No. no. Before. No. Actually, oh, actually, he did issue a statement issued along a second those statement. lines he, he just, after right, King right. was assassinated. He, he issued another that was the second time right. he spoke that's on the right. subject, that's each right. time with great clarity and great power. Oh, yeah, that's the Solidarity and, Express and, now. That's the Solidarity Express. Look, the, the, the role of revolutionary theory and why it's so important is that it is applicable in different situations. That this is, uh, otherwise, you, you, and Mao actually wrote a tremendous amount of, of revolutionary and social theory. Anna Vakin has written that, you know, and, and he's, he's done, they, they both proceeded from the world as a whole. They weren't just speaking about there was a, an element in Mao, actually, of nationalism, which we've actually critiqued. Mm -hmm. Bob Avakian has done a mm -hmm. tremendous critique of the limitations of it, and some of which led to, or contributed to, didn't lead to, but contributed to the reversal of the revolution in China. This is why it matters that he's put communism, he being Bob Avakian, has put communism on a more consistently and thoroughly scientific basis. Because I'll tell you, just one, take one second for the audience here too, that Mao had a little bit of what's in Fanon, that if you just go to the oppressed, well, look, this is a revolution to uh, uproot all oppression. And obviously you're concerned with those who are most oppressed. You, you call the least of these from the Bible. Right. You know, we, the people who catch the hardest hell is what BA says all the time. Yes, that's the revolution is for to emancipate them, to liberate them, but not for themselves, but for all of mankind, Absolutely. for all of humankind, to, to, to overcome all forms of oppression. And that has a scientific basis in understanding the nature of imperialism and the nature of capitalism and how, in fact, you could create a society on a different economic foundation that would be moving towards the elimination. Because I'll tell you what, you don't get rid of all these incorrect ideas, all these 
backward thinking that people have just by uh, just by overthrowing the system. That's the first step. You clear the ground, but then you then then the, then the real struggles on, and and Mao was so insightful on all this. And there were many revolutionary forces in Africa who were taking this up and fighting for it. I mean, in no place in Africa were they were the were the the forces following Mao able to actually, I think, seize power and take power. In fact, they went for, in most of these cases, went for shortcuts and shorter, uh, you know, shortcuts, mm -hmm. either negotiating with the, uh, the colonialists or uh, taking uh, material aid from the Soviet Union at different points and, and trying to also fight just to negotiate rather than actually having a thoroughgoing revolution, which is what Mao was advocating for. Uh, in speaking very much, not just to Africa, but to the oppressed nations of the whole world. He, he even had a whole theory that had to deal with this. He was not just speaking about China. Mao was for the emancipation of humanity, actually. There were shortcomings in his, his, his understanding of that, um, that uh, after he uh, died and, and, and the rule of the masses of people was overthrown in China, Bob Avakian went to work to understand what did he actually do positively and what were the limitations of it. And as such incurred the, frankly, the wrath of a lot of people who, for whom Maoism, as before Leninism, all became practically religions in, in many ways, you know, because they were, it, communism as a science is a living process. It's not a closed system. It's not a set of beliefs that you you then apply. It's not. It's not. There's not. It's not biblical verses. Um, not that you are not a flexible Christian. I know you are. I'm a jazz like. You're Christian. a jazz like Christian. <laughs> That's right. That's but let's open right. it up to the audience. I just wanted to make to clarify that point about Mao because it really matters. Absolutely. Carl, go ahead. Okay. And in as I open this up, what I want to say to people is, you want to have the fullest possible interaction involving as many people as possible. So we're gonna ask that you keep your comments or questions to three minutes so we can get more people involved. And I'm gonna start with the inside audience here. Uh, the brother wearing glasses in the back, all the way back, that's you, you the, the guy, the big guy, right? that's you. Hey, what's up, Carl? Hey, what's up, Brother oh, West, yeah. um, Kazembe? Um, wonderful conversation tonight. Thank you so much for organizing this. Um, I guess my question is bear with me. I'll keep within the three minutes. I'll even do two minutes if possible. I think when I, when I think about Fanon, when he says scratching out Marxism, I think about those, those categories of proletariat and bourgeoisie and him adding the lumping proletariat and the petty bourgeoisie. And then in the colonial context, you don't necessarily have like that strict division, but you have these things are added on, but they're kind of like seen as non-productive. And then you have a situation in Black America right now, where you have like a, like Black folks who are completely dispossessed, homeless, no place to go, and then you have this one percent that's a petty bourgeoisie, but they're not productive. They're not producing anything. And so what I'm wondering is, is that within that context. Is that the way in which we can understand like Fanon's Marxism in terms of this being like saying like, there's a scratching out of that moment. And I'm wondering what we can do with that because I feels like right now, the community or the black liberation movement or the movement right now feels like, is that war with each other? Um, in terms of being able to say, um, I felt like in the sixties, it was like, you know, we're all in this together, right? We're all fighting like in this, and then there were divisions, but we weren't able to do stuff. But then all of a sudden, it got to a point where we were like, all right, now it's more clear and stuff like that. So I hope that made sense. Mm, absolutely. You know what I'm saying? And oh, I, 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 I don't know if we can work with that, but I'm just going to, if you're going to riff off that jazz feature, thank yeah, you. No, no, that's a profound question. No, but I mean, part of it is, again, we've got to look at historical context because applicability it goes beyond context, but context matters. See, in the Black Freedom Movement, it's, after World War II, there were two basic roads. You could go Cold War liberalism, or you could go full-scale decolonization of the Third World, especially Africa. Paul Robeson, Du Bois, Lorraine Hansberry, Stokely Carmichael, the others went decolonization. The mainstream black leadership went Cold War liberalism. See? So they adjusted to the U.S. empire, 
They supported the wars and inventions, Korea, Vietnam, and so forth. They went mainstream, and the culmination was Brother Barack, black face of the U.S. empire, waving the flag, dropping drones on innocent folk, expanding surveillance, wealth inequality escalating, friendly relations with Wall Street while homeowners go under. Child poverty in the black community goes up with a black president. Hey, that's a key sweat moment. <laughs> some, some just ain't right. Because it's the culmination of a Cold War liberalism. And those who did opt for decolonization on the left, assassinated, incarcerated, demonized, like Claudia Jones, deported, lied on, misconstrued, and so the black bourgeoisie, when it emerges in the 60s and 70s, most of them scared to death. They don't want to die. So they assimilate quickly and then try to convince poor black people to live vicariously through their wealth. See how black folk are doing? Just look at how the black celebrities are doing. Oh, my God, look at how they're doing up there. We catching hell down here. What you, when are you going to do something about mass incarceration? When are you going to do something about the new Jim Crow? Don't say a mumbling word. You see what I mean? So that that's the context for the particular e elaboration of the black bourgeoisie. It's not the black bourgeoisie. It's a black lumping bourgeoisie because it's still underneath the white dominated bourgeoisie. But they still got a lot of money and they got elite status. And the more they can, people can trot them out as examples of success, the more they can turn their backs on the precious poor and black people suffering in ghettos and hoods, yeah. you see. So that in that way, I mean, Fanon's analysis is important, but Fanon is not living in the United States in Harlem in that sense. His insight can be appropriated, but we have to be able to use, that's where it gets jazz like. You can listen to Coltrane on your own, play your horn and see what you sound like. And then all of a sudden you say, Wow, I'm not sounding like train at all. They're not supposed to. <laughs> Don't give it up because you can't sound like him. You ain't going to never sound like him. Sound like you. Use what he's doing in order for you to do it. So it is with a revolutionary analysis. So it is a revolutionary praxis. And that's what Ovechkin in so many ways has been doing in his own distinctive way in the 20th and 21st century in that way. And yet at the same time, all of these figures, you know, are going to in the end be inadequate because nobody has full possession of truth. Nobody does. That's a scientific sensibility. It's always growing. It's an endless kind of process. But if you're keeping track on the suffering, if you're keeping track on folk catching hell, then you can still make a difference. And that's the crucial thing, it seems, seems to me, because once you reach the point of such overwhelming despair, people begin to just give up. And see, once you give up, then you're actually consenting to your own oppression because you're no longer feeling as if there's a way out. That's where we started. So we're looking for ways out mm -hmm. no matter what. I'm just, I just going to touch on one aspect, this question of it's not a, the world is constantly changing. Absolutely. And so you need a scientific approach to that, which is principally a method and approach. So, no, it's not that Baba Vakian knows everything that has to be done, even to make the revolution here. There's a lot of work that all of you need to be a part of. Just in case it hasn't occurred to you, making a revolution in this country is going to be very complicated, okay? <laughs> it's already very complicated, and we're barely, you know, we're just getting going here. But what he's developed and where he's put communism on a, uh, really why we make such a, a key reason why we make such a big deal out of this is by putting on it a consistently and thoroughly scientific basis and getting out the elements of communism that were subjective, that were religious, if you will, that were, you know, that the, 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 the repress simply have these, uh, uh, possess the truth by virtue of who they are, getting rid of mm. the ends and the means, you know, as long as our goal is for a classless world. So anything we do between now and then is okay. To the degree that that infected the movements, uh, to the degree mm. that the proletariat yeah. was, that it was seen as just, Look, the world changed. You know, in the 1920s, you could make the case that the proletariat, well, we're going to do it, organize in the point of production, the, the factories and all this. Even then, it was too narrow. 
but the world has changed. As a brother just made a point there, the, 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 there's, there's tens and tens of millions of people who've been marginalized in this society. This is a problem for the revolution, but it's also a source of revolution. And, and, and uh, Baba Bakin has contended, and we are fighting his, his people who follow him, like myself and Carl, to bring to those people, that, not just to get out there, you've been oppressed, now get out there and fight, but to bring to them revolutionary theory, and they can grasp it. And I'll tell you one reason why they can, one piece of evidence by, just talk to some people who were prisoners and who had the time and, and unfortunately, the confinement to be able to actually study revolutionary literature, like mm -hmm. when you and mm -hmm. Baba Bakian had your dialogue and we had just lost a comrade, uh, yeah. Wayne Webb, uh, oh, yeah. Clyde, Clyde Young, a brother who had done some of the most, uh, you know, just had been in prison for a very long bit and became a revolutionary in prison. Malcolm became a revolutionary, took up a different course of, of the Muslim uh, uh, religion in that point. But you see, you can bring to people at the bottom of society revolutionary theory, the basics of it. People can become emancipators of humanity. They don't have to just be out for themselves. Right. And that's how you would appeal to them. And there's all too much of that in, in this society. So my main point, though, is the, to agree with you here that mm -hmm. it's not a closed system. But when somebody makes a breakthrough on how to approach problems, which is what I contend that Bob Avakian has done. That matters a lot, and that actually gives us a way out of this because, look, revolutions, the communist revolutions were defeated because of the power of imperialism in the world. That's fundamentally why we lost the revolution in China and Russia. But the, secondarily, the errors that were made then, including the nationalism in China, which Bob Avakian writes about this, you know, that including that era, disarmed people, he had, you know, you had a stage of national liberation, but if a lot of people came on board because they wanted to liberate China and make it a rich and powerful country, that was not Mao's object. That's not what Mao was doing. Mao was out to transform people's world outlook. It's extremely inspiring stuff that actually brought forward a Baba Bacon to do the work he's doing to change how people thought about the world. Mao was an internationalist, even as he had aspects of nationalism in his, how he came forward and, and in the limitations that existed from what came previously. And that's why the science of revolution keeps developing, but it's been a qualitative breakthrough, in our opinion, with what Bob Avakian brought forward. I'm just speaking about that aspect. The sure. important question, though, about the lump in and various petty bourgeois strata today. Okay. Uh, let's come down front and take the brother with the red t-shirt. And for those of you who are outside, you can submit questions in writing to the staff out there and they'll bring them in. And if you're on the live stream, I think you can, uh, there's a way for you to put in questions too. Yeah, Paul, Paul Robeson. Paul Robeson. Yeah, brother has a Paul Robeson shirt on. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you. Wait, wait, Andy. Andy, um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, when we talk about revolution and speaking within the context of black culture, which would be part of a large revolution, there has to be a revolution of the mind first. And when we read Fanon, you know, his thoughts are contrary to a lot of the thoughts that have been embraced by the black status quo. And when I say that, you know, I refer to Dr. King. Now, I don't know on the new book, this is an old book that I've had for a while, but on page 23, there's just two sentences that Fanon makes reference to nonviolence. But he says here, at the critical designing moment when the colonialist bourgeoisie, which had remained silent up until then, enters the fray, they introduce a new notion, in actual fact, a creation of the colonial situa situation, nonviolence. If nonviolence was a creation of the colonial bourgeoisie, and we find ourselves in this 20 cent 21st century where nonviolence has become central to the black advancement, so much so that the very elect fought to have a national holiday in honor of Dr. King, erect a monument in Washington in honor of Dr. King. And that's not to diminish Dr. King because he was a great intellect. But the question is in the 21st century to see the future and to move forward, 
how do you elevate a Fanon, a Robeson, um, the Deacons for Defense and Justice, mm. the Black Panther elite, um, the Denmark VZs, the Harriet Tubmans, all of whom, you know, I've announced, you know, John Carlos, Tommy Smith, Dr. Tommy Smith, Dr. John Carlos. Yeah. yeah. None of them really advocated nonviolence. So the, the question is twofold. How did we embrace nonviolence, which was an outgrowth of the colonial bourgeoisie, to the exception of all these black luminaries that I just named? And it's not so much the tear down king, but how do you elevate all these other persons, including the 200,000 black men who fought in the Civil War for the freedom of black people? How do you elevate them to a place of prominence such they they get the same recognition and then that allows black people to free their minds yeah. so that their rear ends will follow mm, yes well wonderful wonderful question indeed indeed i can tell you how i try to do it in my own fallible way to my brother is one you start off with the hypocrisy of people calling for people to be nonviolent in mississippi but not calling for the government to be nonviolent in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. See, that's that's Stokely, that's Kwame. That's what he that's the pressure he's putting on Martin King. That's the question that, that's the pressure that Ella Baker's putting on Martin King. And Martin says, dang, I hadn't thought of it. I hadn't thought of it that way. You're absolutely right. right. Then the next move is King, we all agree, was a love warrior. And we had to convince folk, tell the truth. Malcolm X, Stokely Carmichael, they love folk just as much as Martin did. You see, they just come up with a different way. Means and ends analysis, you see. When you love people, it's not as if only the pacifists calling about calling for nonviolence have some priority in loving the people. You see. There's people who love the people, and if you mess with my mama, I'm going to do you in. That's love. You see what I mean? So we've got to conceive of these folk as conductors on a love train, and some of whom did not call for nonviolence out of love. Some of them did call for nonviolence out of love. Some of them called for nonviolence for their careers. It wasn't real. It just posed an imposter in order to be selected by the white power structure, the Carl Rowans and others. Of, of that day, you see. So that you have to keep track of what is actually inside of the hearts and minds of folk. And the only way you keep track of it is you test and see what they're willing to sacrifice. You test and see how consistent they are. So what Fanon was calling for in an African context in which the violence was so thoroughly normalized, routinized, just like in the United States with the lynching and the police and so forth. And he was saying, I've noticed that these colonial bourgeois folk now have introducing this nonviolent stuff. And said a mumbling word about the violence coming at the folk for the most part. And when they did, it, it looked as if it was for their own individual and class interest and not it, well, the universal interest. That has to be pointed out over and over again. And that's what makes the figures that you talk about as important as any other talk about Martin King or any of the other, Desmond Tutu, strong pacifist. Nelson Mandela, no, got to pick up the gun. Anybody deny Nelson Mandela's love for the people? Now, when he rules, he rules as a neoliberal. I was critical of him. That's a separate issue. But when he's a revolutionary, that love is still deep. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you can come right back right quick. I mean, I can speak without. Sure. Well, but they they won't hear it on the they, they won't hear it on the live stream. We can't oh. cut. Oh no. Well, we, we can just hand him the microphone right quick. Yeah, just, just, just hand it right quick. Because just I know you want to come back just briefly though, brother. Yeah. But in, in a larger context, yes, there's no proof. There's no empirical data to say that nonviolence as a means of promoting change is effective. When we look at the struggles that Dr. King championed, and you know, God bless him and his intellect. But here we are 50 years later, 
And you can make an argument that there's few black owned businesses on 125th Street today as there was in 1963. Mm -hmm. The number of black men incarcerated has increased. The number of black on black crime has increased. So if nonviolence has not been effective over the last 50 years, it's not even so much elevating all those other luminaries I've named. It's say, saying, what is the new idea for the 21st century? Mm -hmm. And where should we be in 2068, 100 years after the end of civil rights, which was 1968, 200 years after the ratification of the 14th Amendment, which guaranteed citizenship? Like, what should the vision be? Because it can't include nonviolence as a mode of thinking as what mm. Fanon advanced. Mm. Well, just let me just say briefly what what's required. No, I don't. I don't need them. I think this is Carl's microphone. Yeah. What's required is an actual revolution. And it, we, uh, they, I know there's a lot of hands up in the room, so I don't want to walk through the history of of, of the repression and suppression. The repression of this uh, of the revolutionary elements in the 1960s mm -hmm. in this country. In, then there's another aspect to it of the fact that, you know, people stood up in a different way in opposition to, frankly, what had been the predominant thing within the various uh, left movements in this country. Uh, you know, we'd have to go back and look at the social chauvinism of the Communist Party, the American chauvinism of the Communist Party in the 1930s, uh, you know, and, and the results of how, uh, including problems that, that the united front that was built in relationship to world war ii you have to look at a lot of factors to actually analyze what happened but the key thing to your the heart of your question is we have to say you can't actually change things for the better without overthrowing this system and that ultimately does mean you have to meet and defeat their forces of reactionary violence that defend this system there's no other way to do it now here comes the question and what they drummed into people's heads after was not only nonviolence, and just by the way, we're not gonna discuss it now, but in the, in the 1950s and 60s, there was a tremendous polarization between the Gandhi model of, of, of nonviolence and negotiating with the British ultimately and, and, and reaching a, 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 and Mao. And there's were two different, two different approaches to British, well, it was only Britain that dominated China, but it was one of the imperialist powers. Two different approaches to it. And that had, there were, there were the different forces within um, Africa too that took different sides on the Gandhi Mao split actually during that time and others who went other ways. But I wanna come to your question. What do we do now? This is a declaration and a call to get organized now for a real revolution. And we do want to have, we will have consistency. We're going to fight for consistency between ends and means. Ultimately, we have to meet and defeat them on the battlefield. And Bob Avakian has developed and is continuing to work on a strategy for when, first off, and a lot in here and in his new work uh, that is right here, called This is a Rare Time When Revolution Becomes Possible, Why That Is So, and How to Seize on This Rare Opportunity that goes into how we actually prepare today for that situation, because it's a very rare situation when you could actually make a revolution, when you have the kind of crisis where millions of people are willing to put everything on the line to defeat them, where most important, uh, or one of the key factors there is where you actually have the ruling class unable to rule in the old way. And what this is all based on, what this rare time is, is based on the fact that right now the ruling class is at loggerheads with each other a fascist trend on the one hand and a liberal trend, he would call it, Cornell would call it a neoliberal <laughs> trend that right, is, right. Um, it's a liberal trend, it's a bourgeois trend, it's a form of bourgeois dictatorship, that's what it is. And they're trying to enforce the status quo. They have no answers, you can see this right now on the border, for all the honeyed words, they're doing worse in some ways than, than, than Trump did, because they don't have any fundamental answers. But we have to prepare people now for the time when we actually could make that revolution. And it could be coming because there's such a sharp divide at the top of society. And what we were likely to confront in the coming period of time could open up the possibility where if the third factor that goes into a revolution, which is the existence of a revolutionary people with a revolutionary leadership is built with sufficient force in society that it actually could change the political dynamic and you could get a situation where people would be able to seize power 
to actually make a revolution and, and win? This is a big question. Now, nobody's fronting here that this is easy to do, but there's no other way out of the madness. And right now, humanity faces an existential uh, crisis in the, in, with the environment and, and, and uh, oppressed people, particularly in this country. It's, look, there's Carl and Cornell have talked about a slow genocide of black people with mass incarceration now for a couple of decades. But if these fascists come to power again, it's going to be a fast genocide. Make no mistake, that's what these people are about. And we have to actually get ready now. There isn't a lot of time to do this. And so, yeah, that's going to include what we do in this bookstore. We do elevate the Malcolms, the, uh, mm -hmm. the, 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 those who right. advocated, that's you know, right. Fred Hampton, think people like this. And, and, you know, look, in the 1960s, we, people had to start over in a certain sense because the previous uh, left and com so-called communist movement in this country was not on the right footing. They were, they were not preparing for revolution. They were preparing to, to vote their way into power, anti-monopoly coalitions, and uh, they, they even got to the point of saying communism is 20th century Americanism. I mean, this, is, this was the, the state of things. It's not surprising in an imperialist country like this that that would happen. But we've made a thorough break with that. You know, and, and it's, it's very controversial. Anybody who's hearing this for the first time, you go out and, you, you know, you're going to hear a lot, of, a lot of BS about this movement and Bob Avakian. And that's coming from people who do have a vested interest in the status quo, even if their vested interest is having a little NGO over here or even a big NGO. I mean, this is, this is not a good state of things, but the fact that the situation is so sharp on the one hand, and people are suffering so terribly right now. And the situation in the world is so dire and that there is a revolutionary leadership and there actually is a strategy and there actually is a constitution for a new socialist republic. Do you know what it means to actually have a blueprint for a new society? This is an incredible document because I know there's a lot of people out there who say, oh, I'm an anarchist because I don't want to have anybody telling me what to do. Well, by the way, that's, the, that's also the line of the don't tread on me of the fascists. We actually have to go someplace else with this. And this is the way to build a radically different kind of state that can have its, as its objective overcoming all forms of exploitation and oppression around the world and getting to the point where we don't need states anymore. But that is a long struggle. There's no utopianism in this. This is about how we could really change the world. And I wish, you know, in one sense, a baking has said, and I'm going to just close this. He said, look, if you could change this system nonviolently, it would be unconscionable for him to call for, for him to develop this strategy, for me to be up here at, and Carl to be up here advocating for that if there was a way to do it peacefully, but there isn't. And this is what Mandela did run against up against just to say just to make that point when he mm -hmm. got when he got mm -hmm. out, when he got out of prison and he looked at the situation he said it's in his memoir it would be a bloodbath and i'm not prepared to lead people to do that and now what do you have in now what do you have in south africa today uh, 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 you know i was very involved in that struggle actually what you have today is it's, it's in many ways worse because now you have Black people in the Bantam stands, which still basically exist, having no hope, having no hope, because the people who are ruling them are black people living in gated communities, working uh, in part of the, the neo colonies and all, you know, I mean, with, with the IMF and the World Bank and all of this. It's, we have to break through it. Your, your question is important because we have to get to that point. Where, where people are saying, yes, I, I am prepared to fight, but we got to do it smart. It doesn't mean lashing out with random acts of violence or trying to do. We have, revolution's a serious business. When you call it, when you actually go over that, to that point, it's a serious, serious thing. But I know we have a lot of questions. And yeah, so we, we should, a lot of questions. We got, we got somebody from the Revolution Club in the back there, his hand okay. up. Uh, and okay. People outside and. I will take Josh, then I will go to outside questions. Then I'm going to come back to, that's Jim with the red thing on his cap. Okay, and remember the three minute thing. Okay. It's getting late. A round of questions. Maybe it should be two or three questions at a time. All right, so Josh, that's, that's you good. Start it off. That's good. Get four questions. Remember the three minute thing. <laughs> okay, so I will actually make this quick. Um, so, first, I'd like to 
uh, thank Andy and and Dr. West and Carl and everybody uh, for tonight. Tonight is is absolutely thrilling. Um, and as a uh, and please forgive uh, the audacity of uh, this statement, but as a Rev Com uh, a Rev Club member, as a revolutionary Christian, and as a sax player, I'd like to thank Dr. West especially <laughs> for everything that he has said tonight. Um, I have uh, two quick refutations, two respect, uh, respectful refutations, and two questions. Uh, first refutation, unfortunately, to Dr. West, I must say that um, Mao, I believe, did uh, address white supremacy through uh, addressing Han supremacy because the Republic of China, that is um, uh, the state prior to the People's Republic of China, um, was um, in was indeed basically a, a puppet state of imperialists, of white imperialists, uh, especially Britain, who wanted to control the trade of China, and that was their their method by uh, which uh, they've uh, gone through that. The other refutation is to Andy. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I am an anarchist, and I um, um, the um, which is something that Dr. West has stated before um, to 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 paraphrase Eric Malatesta, solidarity is the law of humanity and solidarity and don't tread on me are they don't necessarily go together so um i personally um but i also i also think that like lumping in anarchists with fascists together is not the best <laughs> the best ideal um you got a minute those now. uh those being said now that i have those representations of the questions um <laughs> first um my first question is um i'm here because of of the well, i joined the 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 revolution club because i believe in something that the right has always addressed which is that the left has um no unity and so i'm here for um um leftist reasons of leftist unity um that being said i I believe in the unification of socialists, um, but I do have a specific problem that Fanon, um, I believe, um, believe, believe talks about, which is like the um, the application of vi the, the applica application of violence to the point of glorification, um, and. I have this specific thing with um, Marxist Leninists who who like to um, who like to um, trump oh, well, um, tout I guess um, apathy and apathy. Okay, the time. Yeah, that's time. Oh, that's time. Okay. That's time. Okay. Um, I just wanted to know like what what do we do about like ML um, just MLs in general with regards to that. Okay, um, that, well, that, that, that will probably be my only question. That but. is your only question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think we'll just keep it. I, think keep it I recognize Jim Farrakh. Let them know who you Use are the so they can give you the mic. You had to use the oh, mic. Sorry, I wasn't using the mic. As always, when I come to this bookstore or when I encounter either of you speaking and other members of the RCP, I'm challenged in a very healthy and productive way, which I don't get happen too much out on the street. But I'm trying to understand today, Fanon was always a romantic hero to me in the 60s, you know? We live in a different time. Violence is a different, there's a different definition of violence and I don't wanna hold on to the violence that destroyed, that allowed the Black Panther Party to be destroyed and their community work not to be recognized by so many. We talk about um, self-defense, the romantic notion of self-defense, which is used a lot, uh, breeds individualism and acts of individualism in terms of self-defense against white supremacy. They do that. Then you have violence. And I'm thinking about the way violence is done today by the dominant powers, you know, the sanctions, the, um, the, 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 all the other things that are violent acts. And I look to the experience of women who have spoken out in the last period of time. 
about the violence that they experienced from a masculinist culture, which promotes self-defense, male version, and promotes violence. Just look at tagging, an essential part of individualism. So I ask both of you, how do you define violence today, the 21st century, and how do you define self-defense in a non-romantic way? Mm. Okay, oh, that's, that's a, a tough one. one. I have a again. question from outside. That's a tough one. Direct. I have a question from outside posed to uh, Dr. West. Can you talk more about the role spirituality plays in spurring revolutionary change, especially among people who consider themselves to be non-religious? Let's take those three and go from there. Mm. Who wants to start? You see, Brother Jim's question is just so deep, we need a double seminar and some cognac. <laughs> <laughs> But we're going to keep that question at the center of the table because violence comes in a variety of different forms. Sometimes it's very similar. When somebody murders somebody in 1900, murders somebody now, that's the same thing. But you got surveillance, you got highly te 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 technology mediating various forms of violence, you got psychic violence, you got spiritual violence. One thing that's crucial is we have to have collectivities, communities, networks, organizations, and, 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 and solidarity among folk to wrestle with these. I don't stand here with any definitive answers. We're living in very, very unprecedented times in this way, you see. But some of the violence we, we can discern fairly clearly. Police killing folk. Right? Police kill somebody, got to go to jail. Period. Mediated with a fair trial and so forth and so on. And that's just basic kind of things. If we could just get that given the disintegration of the bourgeois neoliberal state, we can't even get that for the most part. That, that's partly linked to what, the question about Martin and, and Fannie Lou and the others. They did break the back of a legal, legalized American apartheid, but they couldn't break the back of, of Jim Crow Jr. The reconfiguration of white supremacy after that apartheid regime was broke, they broke the back. Took tremendous courage of fellow freedom fighters of all colors to break that back, but then it gets reconfigured. Imperialism does the same thing. Patriarchy does the same thing. Capitalism does the same thing, you see. But I, I we, but I, I'm just want to gesture toward Brother Jim. And Brother Jim was one of the most consistent folk. We've been talking about this since 1977, right? You know, absolutely, absolutely. But spirituality, we have to be very clear. Spirituality is not about some specters or ghosts out there that people have some unmediated access to. Spirituality is about trying to muster the courage to get up in the morning, to keep loving yourself. The courage not to give in to despair. And that's, again, it's collective. I mean, the Revolution Club is a group of folk who come together to keep alive revolutionary ideas analysis, and you all empower each other. In disagreement and agreement. It's, that's a spirituality there. You see, Abyssinian Baptist Church, there's a spirituality that is connected to a Palestinian Jew named Jesus, absolutely. But the third person of Trinity is about what? It's about the spirit that is manifest in the community. The people are willing to give and sacrifice themselves in such a way that they mutually empower each other and continually mutually empower each other. Every group of people needs something like that, given the overwhelming suffering in the world. The friendship that we have together, when we get together over at restaurant, there's a spirituality, isn't there? And they're as secular and atheistic as they can be. <laughs> but the spirituality is real. Because we, we, we're encouraging each other's courage to keep fighting, to keep bearing witness, to keep telling the truth. And when we get in deep trouble, I can pray and they can just think. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, fine. that's fine with me. They can hope that I'm doing good, but, but, but we, still in, we, we still have a solidarity together. We still fighting together. That's, that's what I mean by spirituality. And it comes in a variety of different forms. Buddhist, Judaic. Christian, secular, atheistic, traditional Africans, and all of their richness, and so forth. Well, I'll just try to be very brief on this question of uh, spirituality. Um, first off, science, and I want to recommend a book I don't have right here. There's observations on literature and uh, uh, art and science. Um, I don't have the title exactly right uh, by Bob Avakian. It's 
but we call it observations. There's a very some very important essays in there. But look, I have uh, a sense of the possibility and a hope for humanity, but it's on a scientific foundation, scientific basis. In fact, Bob Avakian wrote a major paper two years ago called uh, Hope on a Scientific Basis. Very important to read. When you under, where, where the hope comes from, where your uh, belief in the possibility, the potential of humanity to rise above what is comes from is when you actually understand the nature of the problem, the nature of classes, the nature even of, of, of things like white supremacy and patriarchy. These are transitory. They've been around for thousands of years. I mean, patriarchy has. Capitalism has been around for a couple hundred years, a few hundred years. When you understand where these problems come from, that they're transitory, that the, the society can be organized in different ways. When you understand how you could reorganize society in a way that would benefit and overcome these tremendous, tremendous sores of this system, then that can give you hope and belief that you could actually do something better. It makes, you, makes it possible for you to sacrifice, to go you talk about violence. There's a, there's a violence of the state, and it's the most. This is the most violent damn state in, in history. I'm not going to go on about any state that drops an atom bomb once and then drops another one a week later. That is a sick society. Carcerates two and a quarter million people, has police killing two and a half black people a week, and at the same time creates conditions by which our black and Latino youth are killing each other in tremendous numbers. It's a very violent society. The kind of violence that we are talking about is the organized violence of revolution. At the current time, the revolutionary, the revolution clubs have six points of attention. And the last one says, because we are serious about making an actual revolution, we'd neither advocate now or carry out any and oppose all violence against the people and among the people in this situation, because we are preparing for the time when there could be revolutionary violence that could actually win. And what's very important right now is we are coming to that time right now. What I just want to leave you with on this question of, of, of violence and that we need an actual revolution is to get together, get a copy of this, both of these parents' pamphlets, a declaration, a call to get organized now for a real revolution. And this is a rare time when revolution becomes possible. And get together and talk with your friends and come to Revolution Books and talk with people here, get with the Revolution Club, about why is a revolution necessary? Why can't we change this any other way other than an actual revolution? Don't just take my word for it tonight, but go ahead and say, why do we need a revolution? Talk with friends, what's actually involved in a real revolution? How would you actually overthrow a system like this? Why do you have to overthrow it? And then what is this revolution for? We've got this, you, we, we are imploring all of you to start working with those ideas and come up with you. If you're serious about that, you're gonna have at least a hundred questions for us That's and true. for yourself and bring those questions here. Let's go to work on them. The future depends on it. There may not be a future if we don't do this. So that, that's really what I, I wanted to say about this. It, yes, it, 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 that's a different kind of violence. When the oppressed rise up, it's a different thing. But no, it's not just isolated violence in a community or isolated acts of violence. That's not going to change anything. In fact, what will happen is we'll get defeated and people will be demoralized all over again, which is one of the things that happened off of the, the 1960s. There's a lot of demoralization. It was a heavy heart what happened to people like Fred Hampton and others, you know, and all the, all the Panthers who were murdered, let alone Malcolm and Martin and other people. So, so I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Okay. The six points of attention that Andy referenced are available here on a palm card. They have them back at the counter. You should get that and check it out because that's what this Revolution Club is about. And if you're there, then you need to get with the Revolution Club, talk to some of the people in the BA Speaks Revolution Nothing Less t-shirts. Okay, now we're going for another round. Are you, are you all, they're all down for it? You, are you down for well, it? Okay, because I know we're... Well, now we go get some folk outside, though. Well, they're supposed to write this stuff. Oh, oh they write it. Yeah, oh, oh I got you. I got, I got the question. You. Oh, I got you. I got you. Right okay, so let's take... Uh, actually, let's just take that row there. <laughs> where three people... 
all oh, together really, really. Really. And, and they can ask awesome. the, the questions consecutively yeah. and we say something. That's good. That's I'll, cool. I'll be brief. Everyone Make your me? comment or question and then pass the mic awesome. along the road. So first and foremost, I want to thank everyone for coming out. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Um, I just want to say, one of the strategies, like, do you think a universal basic income is a strategy to end poverty and basically, hopefully, initiate social mobility, not only in America, but around the world? Do you think it's a number one revolutionary strategy we can use as a tactic, universal basic income? That's my question. Thank you. All right. Hi. Thank you guys so much for everything and as well as the Revolution Club for the amazing work they're doing. Um, my question is, given the fact that the revolution is already in many ways underway and that it's already clearly indisputable that it's necessary, do you think that there's any ethical interaction with the American empire? Like, does it matter to vote at this time? Does it matter to be increasing voter turnout, especially in the black community, voter education and those sorts of things. Do those still have a place in this time? Or is it that we should solely gear our thoughts towards the revolution and kind of the eradication of the state as a whole? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you both so much for coming out. It's been absolutely thrilling. Um, so I'm, I'll try to be quick. I have the question first and I'll just say like three points about the question. Uh, so the question is, can one be a Christian revolutionary Marxist without believing in God? Because it seems to me, based on Dr. West's thinking, that there are kind of these two different types of Christianity. There's one that's a sort of divine Christianity, very faith-based, and there's another that's more of a practitionary Christianity, which is working within the ethics of Christianity and having that be uh, a process by which change happens. Um, and so the point after that is that um, another question, which is, after assuming that, um, can Christian Marxism, in a sense, uh, be almost a gateway to faith in God? And here, I just want to reference Blaise Pascal, the philosopher. He has a thing about, even if you don't completely believe in God, there's a way to gain faith by practicing the ritual of faith and practicing it so much that you actually start to believe. And St. Augustine, I think, believed this as well. Um, so hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Absolutely. No, we've got quite a threesome. OK, so we got three uh, questions. Uh, who you, wants, who wants to? Uh... Well, just very, very quickly. I mean, the issue of the relation between reform and revolution has to be, we have to be very clear about uh, uh, that there's always a need to struggle to secure the, the basic rights of everyday people, including basic liberties. See? So when Angela Davis is, is going to be dragged to jail and executed, you bring in William Kunstler and Charles Gary and others to deal with the bourgeois liberal order to make sure that her rights are protected. That's not revolutionary, that's reformers. That's her life. That's her life. And I just use her as one example in terms of universal health care, universal basic income, very important. It attenuates, it cuts back on, but it's not abolishing poverty. It's not abolishing the uh, uh, domination at the workplace. You're going to have to have a fundamental transformation of capitalism for that. So we have to be honest with the people and say, this is not revolution. This is something short, but we care about you and therefore, we're fighting for you with a revolutionary vision. Now, the worst thing you could do is, is lie to the people and tell them, all you got to do is vote for so-and-so, you're going to be free. All you got to do is get this policy, and you're going to be liberated. No, that's a lie. But, it's, but reform and revolution are very different things in this regard, you see. And same is true, therefore, in terms of voting. You see. When you say, okay, we want to vote anti-fascist for Biden, we know he's an architect of a crime against humanity with mass incarceration. We know he supported crime against humanity in Iraq. We know we can go on and on and on. Tell the people the truth and then say it's an anti-fascist vote. We got neo-fascism escalating and so forth. And that was part of the dialogue with Brother Vicken and the others that, of just a few years ago. So voting is still important, but it's just one slice. Same as to all of these different issues 
are significant slices. You see, that the, the fight for women's control over their body. That's very important. Women's voice, bodies and humanity is crucial, right? But that's not revolution. And so you just be candid in that regard, you see. Now, in terms of that last question, brother, in terms of, you know, God talk and so forth and so on. I mean, that's going, that's a, that's a long, long, long question. But you got to keep in mind what we're talking about in part is the power of stories and narratives in orienting people in, in, in terms of how they live their lives. You see, that all the God talk in the world is rendered in narratives, Hebrew scripture. Part of the genius of Hebrew scripture is you are to be human at your deepest level when you're spreading hesed, loving kindness and steadfast love to oppress people, to orphans and widows and so forth. And you can go to the same Hebrew scriptures and what happened to the Canaanites and the Melchites? Genocide. It's right there. It's right there. Which stories are you going to, are, are you going to listen to? And they're secular stories. You can get turned on by George Eliot in Middle March. She got a lot of empathy in there. Powerful. But analysis, no. Moral vision, yes. Same is true with music. And we can go on and on and on. The Ode to Joy of Beethoven and Wreath of the Respect written by Otis Redden. All of those are ways in which it teases out things inside of us that can make us more courageous and compassionate. And the religious stories like that, the secular stories, the religious art in Bach or in Walter Hawkins' gospel music, and then they're secular, Bob Dylan in his pre-Christian moments and so forth. So, so that all of these are feeding into us as persons who are trying to be forces for good before the worms get our bodies. <laughs> Well, and I know there's a lot of questions here. I'm not going to speak to that last point right now, um, <laughs> uh, except to say that Aretha had to change the lyrics uh, from Otis Redding. As much as I loved Otis Redding, yeah. Aretha did change respect from respect for me, the man when I come home, to that's true a feminist thing against that's true. the way she was treated, oh, yeah. and so we should we should look at that. Um, listen. Uh, on the other two questions, uh, to answer, to, just to speak to as directly as I can, uh, this is a book I want to recommend to you. It's uh, quotations, uh, basics, get it, B-A, basics, from the talks and writings of Bob Avakian. Chapter three is called Making Revolution, and it begins with basics 3.1. Let's get down to basics. We need a revolution. Anything else in the final analysis is bullshit. Now, that doesn't mean we don't unite with people in all sorts of struggles short of revolution. We definitely need to do that, but proffering any other solution to these monumental and monstrous problems and outrages is ridiculous, frankly. And that's the fundamental truth on this. In terms of, uh, uh, you know, uniting with struggle, uh, the revolution clubs, uh, have, and it's a very big part of our strategy, is fighting the power and transforming the people but for revolution, we enter into struggles. We are calling for contingents at Saturday's march, revolution contingents. People should come out. It, this is, I'm, not, I'm gonna get emotional and get angry and I'm gonna try to keep it brief so I'm not gonna go there. But the idea that, that the right for women to control their own lives is being stripped away and there aren't hundreds of thousands of people in the street every day is yeah. fucking outrageous. Yeah. But if all we do is go there, as the Women's March is actually going to do, we're going we're gonna to be at that. We're building it, okay, to feed into the next midterm elections. That is a loser, and that's exactly why we're in this situation, because they've continually played games with this system, and it is the people who want to be inside. It's... I'm not going to get going, but I could really get going on this when I saw do not bring coat hangers, do not bring, don't come as handmaids because that disrespects women of color because women of, uh, women of color have been, we've been dispossessed all along. Yeah, you want to know who's most affected by this? Women of color. That's who can't have, doesn't have the money in Texas to get to Oklahoma. Those, those are the mothers with three kids, but they, they, they got pregnant and, and, now, they, and now they can't afford to be able to, 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 to deal with that pregnancy. 
Listen, we, we have to, we, no, don't, voting is something that in, under this system that is giving your approval and legitimating a criminal dictatorship over the masses of people. Now, it is true that in the last presidential election, because we did not have the force that we needed to actually drive that regime out, and Cornell and myself were part of the, and Carl uh, refused fascism. We tried to get millions mm -hmm. of people to take to the streets yeah. and demand that the Trump-Pence regime be removed from office, and people said, no, thank you, we're going to keep, keep voting. It did them a lot of good. They got exactly what Cornell said with Biden. And the most that Biden did, and Avakian wrote this in it uh, last year, he said is he bought some time, but he Avakian wrote that before the inauguration, he's going to fail miserably, and you can see that happening now, not just because he's, whatever his personal deficiencies are, it's not about that, actually. Just like the problems in Africa are not about that people are corrupt. You know, the people got into are corrupt. It's a system that does this. It's a system. You have to understand what you're facing. That's why revolution is necessary. So, yes, in that election last year, we said vote against Trump. You know, and we said, yeah, you got to vote against Trump, not in a symbolic vote. You had to vote for the Democrats so that, you, you know, and that was just barely enough. Believe me, if it had been closer, these fascists would have won. And they're still creating the structures right now and the delegitimizing of even a concept of truth such that they're preparing to seize power again in these next elections. So, no, you got, we've got to organize now for an actual revolution. That is the most important thing you can do. Now, if people are rising up and struggle, yes, unite with them. But bring to them revolutionary understanding. You know... People say it's impossible, but people always say that about revolution before it happens. And they say, well, I, I knew that was inevitable, you know, but, <laughs> but you know, no, you, you've got to actually work for it. And, and you're going to go, we're going against the tide here. I mean, I'm glad that there's a sympathetic audience, but that, that's not most of society right now. And even here, I'm sure a lot of you got a lot of questions about who is this guy talking about all this kind of stuff? Is that really real? Is it really possible? Would it really be better? Could we actually win? You know, what's it for, what's it about, and how do we do it? These are big questions. We've got to get into them now. But anything else is really, in the final analysis, bullshit, because nothing's going to... You have to get rid of the system. You have to cut the cancer out and push it over here and then build something else. And that's the importance of the Constitution, because it's, you've got to put something in place that's actually going to go to work, go to work on solving these problems. You know, you think uh, men are going to be angels the day after the revolution? Well, they're going to be transformed through the cost of the revolution, but they're going to, there's still going to be a lot of patriarchy sitting in the heads of men and women. You know, and particularly in this third world, these third world countries, you know, patriarchy is largely enforced by the mother-in-law. Just telling you that's how it is. And so there's a lot of deep stuff that we have to uproot, but we can uproot it because we can understand it. And that is a way of having giving you belief here that you can actually do what's, what needs to be done and can make you hopeful about the future when you see people taking up and rising up and struggle. And it's very painful when they don't know, when they rise up and struggle as they did in the Arab Spring, but they don't really know what the problem is that they're facing. And you can say, oh my God, if they don't actually form genuine revolutionary communist parties, they're going to they're, they're gonna get, they're gonna get fooled again and, and, and be victims of deceit by the ruling classes and self-deceit in what they understand. Okay. Sure. sure. We, we have one more round. Do okay. We're, okay. So we're going, to, we're going to do another round of questions. Oh, we got to do outside. Well, we got a couple of different sources. One outside. Anybody sitting out in the cold at least gets a question. Okay, so we've got one from the live stream. Fanon continues to be influential among groups that speak of colonizers and white people interchangeably. And decolonization means land back to the colonized and expulsion of the colonizers. Can you address the problems with this view? That's from the uh, live stream. From outside, if the present government were to be overthrown, what would be put into place to stop utter chaos? This country is not united. We need equity first, and then we can start to have revolution to be born in our minds and hearts. And let me go 
all the way to the back. Black mask and kind of gold shirt. Yeah, thank you so much um, to both Andy and Dr. West um, for your insight and for your time today. Um, I guess my first question um, is kind of directed to Andy. Um, for a student like myself who might not know, when you talk about a scientific methodology to a Marxist ideology, like how would you define that? Just because I'm a little unclear on the definition. And the second question, perhaps more pressing to both Dr. West and um, Andy would be, um, like a Andy talked a lot earlier about how, especially with uh, w one of Mar uh, Mao's greatest contributions was talking about how, how quickly uh, Maoism and Marxism can revert back to uh, imperialism and capitalism. Um, and that's exactly what happened. And that type of change was precipitated both in China with a shift from Maoism to a more imperialist CCP and also in Russia with um, from Leninism to Stalinism after the passing of Lenin. So I, I guess my question to that would be, how do you sustain a long-term non-imperialist, in Andy's case, Marxist revolutionary movement that doesn't die with the passing of an ideological pur purist or a single individual such as Mao, while at the same time avoiding some of the authoritarianism that was characteristic of Maoism? But thank you. <laughs> I'll take the guy with the black mask and black jacket, and the last of this round. As, as long as you can remember all the questions, <laughs> we're, we're good. <laughs> good. Exactly. Thank you so much for that talk. That was incredible. Um, speaking as a college student, I feel that the college campus is kind of a paradox. And in, in one case, or on one side, it's sort of this really this melting pot of revolutionary ideology in society. Yet on the other hand, it's the feeding ground for Wall Street and the, you know, the institutions of oppression in society. And it oftentimes feels like the ones who are espousing the most revolutionary ideologies most passionately end up being recruited the quickest into the power structure. So uh, how, do you, how do both of you feel that we can allow for the revolutionary ideology to break free from the academy and to permeate into society and for it not to just dissipate once those espousing it uh, are become it's once it's their time to enter the workforce and they leave this sort of utopia that, that they're residing in. Thank you. Mm. Wow. Wow. Well, we got okay. some high quality questioners in this crowd. Huh? You, that. you want to go you first? Ready? You want me to go? Uh, uh, well, let me go first, though, brother, for you break this. That the, and I'm going to be very brief because. I'm not going to say anything about the complexities of the transformations of Maoism and the variety of post-Maoist ideology and so forth. That's a, that's a whole, whole huge set of questions in terms of uh, ways in which structures of domination are not fundamentally rooted out and they recast themselves and elites. But see, I would argue there is a role for corruption among elites, but the system itself can reinforce that corruption when you don't have mechanisms of accountability. And this is true for any group of elites in a university, in a church, in a mosque, in a synagogue, in a, in, in a society and so forth. That's why democracy has to be so robust. That's why the voices of masses must be heard. And it's so easy to attenuate and to marginalize masses in that way. Now, when it comes to the dynamics of the professional managerial class, that's what you're talking about when you're talking about college and universities. Two thirds of our brothers and sisters between 18 and 40 never go to a college, never set foot in college. It's only 31%, and it's lower for black folk. You see. So that the college is a space that produces a culture for the professional managerial class. And the dominant tendency, of course, is to be recruit, recruited into the elite structures, the Wall Streets and si Silicon Valleys and big tech and big military and so forth and so on. Then they have their own little silo and all their little prizes and titles and status and reputation and cocktail parties and so on. Then you say, OK, they're human beings like anybody else. Some of those folk don't commit class suicide. They're going to see how empty and shallow and hollow it is. And they're going to fall in love with oppressed people. And they're going to say, Lo and behold, I'm interested in the truth. I'm interested in fighting suffering. I'm going to use whatever skills I have coming out of the college to do that. That's why you get some folk who go to college, like the boys, 
the genius of this community in the, in the 1940s and 50s was who? A whole lot of them. One was James Baldwin. Never went to college. Two colleges went through him. <laughs> Sometimes that's better. See, nobody who ever went to college can write essays he could. But he had the same love of people and the discipline and so forth, you see. And so he became part of the celebrity class. He could have accommodated himself through the dominant orientation of the celebrity. He'd just stay in the laps of luxury. He refused to do it. He went back into the belly of the beast in American apartheid in the South. He went back to interview Elijah Muhammad in Chicago and say, oh, he's a human being too, given all of his critiques and limitations, because he's trying to look for a way out too, given his own black nationalism with all of its you know, challenges, problems, and even xenophobia and so forth in terms of black, white people as devils and so forth and so on. He's trying to work this thing out. And that's what Baldwin was trying to do. So that's what we, that's, that's, that, that, so that's a challenge to you right now, 2021, in college, already a privilege, imperial privilege, male privilege, class privilege, racial privilege, but whiteness is never identical or reducible to white supremacy because white brothers and sisters have a history of fighting white supremacy when they choose to give up certain conceptions of themselves and certain benefits in that system. And John Brown ain't no joke. And we can go on and on. Oh, Vakian, one of the great examples of that, right? Because he's Arminian, right? Exactly. Who's going to think that an Arminian brother from California going to be on the revolutionary cutting edge of the next time? <laughs> hey, that's a choice he made. That's a vocation he pursued because he got a love of the people. So that in that sense, don't let any of this talk in the professor managerial class about identity paralyze you. Don't, don't let them reify you, make you feel that somehow because you're white or, 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 or black or so forth, you necessarily have some inherent X or Y. You don't. Everybody can choose to be a gangster or a freedom fighter. Thank you. Everybody can choose to be a thug or a freedom fighter. That's part of the humanism of Phenom, part of the humanism of Achaia, part of the humanism of Abyssinian Baptist Church. You see what I mean? And then you have to look inside of your own soul and say, ah, now how am I going to use my biographical history in light of the larger historical project of freedom? But that's an individual choice. Your vacant could have given up a long time ago. Right. Brilliant as he is, he could be a multi-billionaire. Right. He said, no, right. I'm going to bear witness. That's the inspiration. You don't even have to agree fully ideologically with him. I don't. I'm moved by his example. I'm moved by his courage, you see. And there's others as well on all different parts of town. I'm sorry to go on and on, but this is a very important question for the younger generation because the younger generation these days think that, Oh, and lo and behold, I'm woke. I'm woke now. So, oh, you, you, you stay woke, you're going to suffer from insomnia now. <laughs> no, we don't want woke folk who are not going to be long distance runners for freedom. You got to fortify yourself, equip yourself to be a long distance runner. So, you know, when you wake, take a nap, go to sleep, bounce back, organize, mobilize, read, tell a joke. Meditate, keep moving. Raise your kids, still be a freedom fighter. That's what is crucial. And that shatters through all of this petty bourgeois neoliberal talk about wokeness. Thank you. Mm -hmm. said, no, we're looking for something real here. Man, we don't want the simulacra and the copies. We want the real thing. We got another genius from, from Harlem named Nicholas Ashford and Valerie Simpson. They wrote a song called Ain't Nothing Like the Real Thing. They looking for the real thing. One of the things about these two brothers, even though I still got my disagreements, we'll probably go to grade with it. They are the real thing in terms of they say what they mean and they mean what they say. They're not posing and posturing. They're willing to live and die for what they're talking about. That's crucial. You have to have that. In any movement, you have to have that. That's why we love Malcolm. When he said white folk were devils, he believed it. <laughs> he gave us evidence. When he changed his mind, he said, I was wrong. I believe it. He gave us evidence. He's a serious, he's got integrity, even when he's wrong. He's got honesty, even when he's wrong. 
That's the kind of folk you got to be to want to work with because you got a lot of phonies and fakes out here. And that's the last thing you need in a moment like this. Yeah. Well, we got a lot of questions on the floor. I'm going to try and be brief too. I, I, I just not speaking of Ashford and, and Simpson, but speaking of uh, it's the real thing. Um, <laughs> that's going to get to the question of science. Uh, brother in the back, uh, student, it was he, he, you. You asked the question. Uh, just I don't want to misquote you. You said, "What is the scientific approach to communist ideology?" Was that how did you phrase it? For the way I phrased it was, um, you reference uh, like a scientific method when right. you talk about Marxist ideology, and I just wanted kind of a definition or a clarification. On right. That. Well, it's, it's a science. What Avakian has, has done when I said he made uh, he developed a, 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 a um, he put communism on a more science thoroughly and consistently scientific basis. Communism, as was developed by Marx, was was a scientific way of understanding, if, you know, the germ of of society, the the commodity production. He wrote a book called Capital, actually, several volumes. He developed an understanding of how societies were. It's science is understanding reality. That's the point. That's the point of departure. What is, how do we understand reality? How do we observe that reality? What are the patterns within that reality? Mm. What principles and, 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 and patterns can we see that then we can then uh, uh, develop an understanding of, of what any particular thing is and then you come along, why we stress method and approach is reality is constantly changing. I mean, chaos is the order of things. That's, that's, that's how things actually are. They constantly moving. And so you need to understand that to be able to be able to, uh, to certainly to lead a revolution, to cure a disease. I mean, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, the, you know, in the, in the COVID thing, well, they, 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 they changed their mind. One minute we shouldn't wear a mask, one minute we should wear a mask. What's, what's going on here? Well, they're studying the data. They're looking at they're looking at large uh, pieces of evidence. What Avakian has done is it's not, it, it, it's, it's not just an ideology over here and science over here. It's science, it, it, there, there's a communism it, as, as we've developed it and as it actually originated is a way to understand the world. And then as Marx said, you know, the point, hitherto philosophers have only interpreted the point after all is to change it. You need to apply that science to understand the world in order to be able to address the problem as it actually exists and then develop the ways to actually transform it. And, and that's what's led us to, not just us, but it's what led Marx and Engels, his collaborator, Lenin. Stalin tried to continue that. He had serious shortcomings in doing so, but he actually did fight to keep the Soviet Union on a socialist road uh, and, and ran headstrong into the, you know, the, uh, the, the Nazi regime, which actually, by the way, the Soviet Union is what defeated Nazism, not the U.S., but the U.S. was able to reap up the spoils of that. And Malcolm was also continuous and actually had critique of Stalin. And then we've gone even further in that through the work of Bob Avakian. So I, I just wanted to say that because it's, it's very important to understand that this is, a, this is something that people can take up themselves. They can take up and learn this theory. They can, uh, you know, they need leadership for it. And there is a revolutionary organization. This is our, our, our bookstore and this is the center of that movement. But this is, this is a tremendous liberating thing. And we need to spread it on the college campuses. You, you know, part of it, I, I don't know who these um, revolutionaries on your campus are, but... Um, uh, send them here, uh, uh, okay? We'll, we'll work with them so that they're not so enthralled. A lot of these revolutionaries think it's revolutionary to form a little NGO somewhere and, and help a few of the people for some of the time only to have it snatched back by this system, by the very workings of the system. See, that's what happens. You know, the brother who said earlier, the, the, the New York City schools are more segregated when they, than, than, they, than in the 1960s when I was growing up in this city. They're more segregated today after all that struggle, civil rights, black, all of this. The system is the system. It works the way it has to work. It can't work any other way. That's a big discussion. Come back here. We'll talk about it. Talk about it with the staff. It can't work any other way. 
And that's why we need to overthrow it and bring about a new system that would go uh, to work on that. I agree with what Cornell said uh, you know, around woke culture. Bob Avakian's written a, uh, a, an article that's the kicker to it, subtitles, I'm so sick of this woke culture. It's very poisonous. It's very poisonous. You know, and, and part of the thing of, you know, mm. you know, uh, there was a question here about whiteness and decolonization. Oh, I, 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 right. I, white supremacy is the problem. It's woven into the, into the history of this country. And white people do have to think about that and they have to act on it and not try to cash in on it, okay? But, and they need to fight against it just as everybody needs to fight against it. But this is not some, uh, you know, like a ranking of this because you see already that ranking, ha well, you're a black man, but you're not a black woman, are you? Well, black woman, she's more oppressed than you. Well, wait a second, what about a trans woman? What about, you know, it, it never ends. And, you know, Avakian said in your dialogue, he said, you know, if I, if I wasn't a, a white man, I'd be, well, you know, you just go, to, you're not Bangladeshi. Will you have anything to say about that? What about, you know, this is not what this is about. This has to be about emancipating all of humanity. And nobody should want to make a career out of owning their own oppression. Okay? That's part of the problem. See? And we have to get past it. But see, everything has been so commodified uh, this uh, mm -hmm. entrepreneurialism is 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 deep in all these ngos it's got to be broken with it has nothing to do with people getting free yeah. it's that roadblock to it and the thing that's painful about it again is these are people who do care they're not people necessarily going right mm -hmm. away to wall street they're trying to mm -hmm. do something else you know, I've got some younger cousins who get into all this stuff and that that's what they all do, you know, and and yet they're not taking care of the business that has to be taken care of. It's just existing on the margins of this society. OK, we have to actually change the whole thing. And we're at a point in history where the whole thing is go it's heading right off a cliff. See, that's the thing. Mm. And so, yes, even when it was unfavorable through these last terrible decades, a few of us have stayed on the revolutionary course, frankly, thanks to Avakian. Probably all the rest of us would have not, not been, we would, would have been some little left group just trying to build our own thing. We are a small group, but we're a small group that, that is aimed at emancipating all of humanity and has never lost that aspiration, never lost that determination, and continue to develop the theory and the practice to be able to do the one thing that needs to be done more than anything else in the world, which is overthrow U.S. imperialism, and that would change everything. Yeah. So right. that's, that's, right. that's, that, that's what this is all about. It's not about anything else. It's not about what you think of anybody personally or that... Somebody, you know, and I have just to say on this corruption point, when you're, if you're, if you don't have a scientific understanding of what the system is and you think, well, okay, we'll just get rid of the evil white colonialists and then we'll, we'll run this, this country. Well, you're going to get, you're going to get cut off by the IMF. You're going to get, you're going to get all kinds of loan. You're going to get to order to do business the way you did business. You're going to be forced to play their game or you don't play their game. And that takes science and determination. I will tell you what, this is going to be a revolution where initially it's going to be for less. No, you're not going to have, I was trying to get some toothpaste last week and I just, walked into the drugstore, which, uh, and I couldn't fucking believe it when I was there was, there was literally, I started counting, I gave up at 48 different kinds of toothpaste. I'm sorry, we don't need that. We don't need that. You know, we need to, we need a few varieties, but, you know, but what, what, the, the whole thing is, it's a sick, you know, we don't need rims on the car. We don't need closets filled with, you know, I, this is ridiculous. This is, I mean, I, I just, you know, you know, there's 500 channels on TV and there's hardly anything on worth watching. Uh, I mean, there are some things worth watching, okay? And, but these are the things that, this is a, this society is no good. Let's get rid of it. And it can be done. That's, so that's, that's what I want to say. I'm missing another question. Did, I don't yeah, know. Just one. You, you got yeah, three I mean, out of four. Uh, if, three out of four. That's pretty good. <laughs> if the present government were to be overthrown, what would be put into place to stop okay, utter chaos? That, I had a short answer for that. This is, this is what will be put into place of it, okay? 
the Constitution for a New Socialist Republic in North America. And if you want to understand a bit more about why it is possible, after it, it's the reason um, the communist revolutions uh, eventually were defeated is not because they had uh, great leaders, uh, but it had to do with the, um, the combination of principally the surrounding of the first socialist states by imperialism, the persistence of capitalist relations in the world which meant that the people within those societies, you know, have, have a, a, a whole, they see this capitalist world out there, and the shortcomings when, within those societies, principally in how people understood the problems they were facing. I mean, uh, 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 you know, uh, let me just tell you this quick thing. Right before Mao, uh, you know, or, or a famous saying of Deng Xiaoping, who was the, what Mao called the capitalist rotor, who was behind overthrowing uh, communist rule in China after Mao died, Deng Xiaoping said, black cat, white cat doesn't matter as long as it catches mice. You see? And that's not true. It matters what you're actually trying to do. It matters wh wh whether it's you're on the capitalist road under a socialist society, you're, you're replicating some of the same things that existed before in new forms, or you're actually trying to uproot all the forms of uh, domination that had existed before, such that under Mao, under China, they had a, 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 the, le the leading slogan society was uh, serve the people. After Mao was overthrown, it was uh, to get rich is glorious. So, those, so that black cat, white cat actually made a difference how you were going to feed the people. That's the point about yeah, catching absolutely. mice. Mao always spoke in these poetic ways, but Anyway, so look, there is a way out of the madness. I want to invite all of you to come back to Revolution Books, to, um, to come back to Revolution Books, to get, get a copy of Basics, get a copy of the Constitution, and particularly pick up these Which two one? short pamphlets. Um, are we missing a question? Well, I think if you're all concentrated in the book, there was a great question about the law. Somebody asked about the law. Oh, yeah, she's yeah, right. The colonization. Oh, about the colonizing. Right. 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 Yeah. Yes. Well, I appreciate that. Okay. So just let's repeat the question. Yeah, well, let let, 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 let uh, my wife lay this well, out. Yeah. I have the question here written down. Oh, okay. Fanon continues to be influential <laughs> among groups that speak of colonizers and white people interchangeably. And decolonization means land back to the colonized an expulsion of colonizers. Can you address the problems with this view? Oh, we, we yes. did the first part. We, we hit the first we part, the, but not the of, second part. Exactly, because I mean, Fanon's revolutionary humanism recognizes that black people have the capacity to colonize, black people have the capacity to be imperially elite, but given the history of the modern world and the age of European empires, most of the colonizers of the Western Hemisphere were European. Most of the colonizers of Europe were Europeans. So that's the truth to be told. The inference is not that somehow black people don't have the capacity to colonize or that black people don't have the capacity to accommodate themselves to that colonization. So it's that new revolutionary humanism that Fanon has. And those who think that Fanon is reducing whiteness to white supremacy or re be believing that somehow black people don't have the capacity to colonize are misreading him. It's misconstruing him, and yet you got a contention among the Fanon interpreters I think of, of the moving question, in that direction. I think the question, the second part of the question, though, is about the land question. On land reform. And, uh, well, now, land reform. Land reform is very important. Well, I think it's actually more around settler. The, what I, if I heard the question correctly, that um, that in these in the peasant countries, land is the key question, and that the in decolonizing, you have to expel the people who are occupying your land is that was that what it said uh well the the question the second part of it, I, I, I the qu it was okay <laughs> yeah let, let me just say this <laughs> all right there is a decolonization movement in this country and it's talking about decolonizing the u.s and there are a lot of debates about what it exactly right. means right. one of the things to me that is important is you want to decolonize the U.S.? Well, why don't we start by making a revolution Thank you. here in the belly of the beast, and then we can deal with 
all of the crimes that it's it's committed, including against the indigenous people. And that's spoken to in the Constitution for a new socialist republic in North America. Mm -hmm. And it breaks that down with a lot of specificity. Mm -hmm. That's to me is the, the heart of the problem. The people are talking around the need for revolution and actually getting with the getting rid of the imperialist ruling class and talking about what they're gonna do with the land, like somehow they're gonna get the US imperialist ruling class to give up what it has without going to the question of how do you make revolution, which is at the heart of how you're gonna get free anyway. Well, I think that's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I didn't mean to step on. <laughs> no, you didn't step on it. No, 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 you, you, you're telling the truth, brother. This is as far as we're going to go tonight. Uh, what, what time is it right now? Somebody say. It's 10 o'clock. Is it 10 o'clock right now? It's 10 o'clock. Okay, this is as far as we're going to go tonight. I want to thank our speakers. <laughs> I want to thank our speakers. <laughs> I also I want to thank you all both the live audience and the virtual audience on the live stream, come back to Revolution Books. Come back and get into some of what Andy and Cornell were talking about. Get Absolutely. into the declaration and call to get organized for an actual revolution. And Bob Avakian's article that deepens that this is a rare time when revolution becomes possible, why that is so, and how we must act to seize on that. And also, Andy referenced uh, contingents in the Women's March for Abortion Rights. Yep. That's the break the chains, unleash the fury of women as a mighty mm. force for revolution. Mm. That's the title of the contingent. And what's the details before I mess them up? Well, they should just see. Uh, or see the people in the revolution, nothing yeah. less t-shirts get with them on that you can Absolutely. buy copies of the book Absolutely. you'll sign you'll sign a few of them well i got to get you, you got to get out of here okay no, no, no. okay all right yeah, just we'll definitely get the uh book and uh support revolution books absolutely support revolution books by the way absolutely